This is Free Talk Live, and it's the live Sunday edition of the program. Joining you in the studio tonight, you've got me, Ian. And me, Mark. Uh, Coming up here tonight, the Topless event has happened. Uh, GoTopless.org. 60 cities worldwide, including uh, New York and our very own uh, Hampton Beach, New Hampshire, on a rainy day in New Hampshire. We will uh, talk about that, and I'll try to find a picture of the event to post up on our Facebook page at some point. So be patient with us on that one. We're actually going to start out with, uh, instead of your calls, we'll get to you and your thoughts, and please be patient. Uh, We can still talk to you about anything. But every now and then, Mark, uh, we do have special guests here on Free Talk Live. Sometimes they've been on before, and uh, this one has. Mark, can you introduce our guest? Tonight? Yeah, this is Stefan Kinsella. He has, um, um, you know, I guess his his name has been made sort of in the liberty movement as uh, surrounding uh, the ideas of intellectual property. He's an intellectual property lawyer. But um, I think in many ways he gets uh, kind of pigeonholed, and he's written on a variety of topics. And I, he, He's an attorney. He is an attorney, right? Um, he, he sent me an email last week uh, just kind of more clarifying um, sending some articles that he'd written clarifying his position on what law means and i thought it'd be better if he just came on and explained it to us okay Stefan, welcome back to free talk live hey Ian, thanks a lot what motivated you to uh to write out uh, write the email to mark what was it that you heard on the air uh, that was uh, i guess inspired your comments I heard you guys talking, and uh, you were talking about restitution and punishment and people working off their crimes. But one thing you said uh, was you just kind of had an offhand comment where you – I know it was informal. You're on the radio, but it was like you equated law with what's written down or what the legislature makes. Which I would I call those not. statutes, actually. I don't generally call that the law <laughs> personally. Right. Right. Yeah, I figured you kind of misspoke or were just speaking informally, but I just wanted to write and uh, talk about what law is and how the one of the great mistakes that is made now, even by libertarians, quite often is we think of law in terms of what has been decreed by some source, right? And nowadays that's the legislature, which is you can call legislation or statutes. So that was kind of one point I wanted to make how we we sort of lose sight of how the very notion of what law is has been corrupted by the state's monopolization of law. Just what do like, you call law? Well, law is just basically a series of what you could call legally enforced rules that govern social, you know, interpersonal social conduct in a given region uh, on the earth. Nowadays, that field has been monopolized by the state provision of law. So law is just uh, you know, a regular set of uh, interactions governed by some kind of regularly enforced social rules. So I know that um, in English common law that essentially law was enforced with generally without the power of the executive branch, the king, and being involved. Judges would sort of you know circle around or whatever. They people would hold somebody they felt to be um, you know guilty of some crime or another. The judge would hear the case and whatever the punishment would be would be meted out and that sort of thing. And it wasn't exactly a monopoly because you were a judge based on, in many cases, whether people would use you and hire you. I think there's there's something to that, although I think libertarians sometimes are, have a little bit too much of a rosy view of the English common law as being a okay. kind of uh, proto-libertarian type of legal system. It is an example of a more decentralized legal system that is – decentralized courts, and also there were different legal systems. There was the canon law, the church, and other – there was equity law, and there was uh, the regular uh, king's courts. But they were decentralized, and the difference between a decentralized system and uh, a legislative system, which is what dominates today, is that there's usually someone who decides the result between two parties that have an actual dispute… And he tries to come up with a just result. There's no guarantee that he would, but the result is only between those parties and only binds those parties. So anything the judge or the or the jury says that's outside of the uh, necessary confines of the dispute before them is called dicta, just words. So if a judge says, uh, you know, A wins, he gets ten thousand dollars from B because he damaged him. Uh, and he said, and by the way, I think that in the future everyone should have to uh, not discriminate based upon sexual preference. That would just be called open dicta. It would be ignored. He can't legislate from the bench. If he did, no other court would follow it. So that limits the power of these individual tribunals. 
Interesting. So um, is, is, that the, is that the way things are today? I mean, do judges, because judges give their opinions all the time while sitting up, uh, up there. Do, does it matter now? They do, and, and dicta still is is a, is a, is a tenet of uh, of the law. But the thing is, the role of judges has been changed. The role of judges now is 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 uh, uh, very rarely to try to find the just result in a common law type setting. When they do, the results are usually commonsensical and they're okay. But I would say ninety percent or ninety five percent or more of what judges do, especially federal judges, is. Their job is not to find justice in a given case or controversy. Their job is to interpret words written down on a piece of paper, which is the so-called law, which is legislation or a statute. So their job is just to interpret the constitution or some federal or some state statute. Even if they don't agree with the result, even if the result would be unjust, like copyright or the constitution itself, they just have to read the words and they're try administrative, to administrative uh, yeah, they're law functionaries. Judges. They're, they're basically civil functionaries of the administrative state. That's correct. Now, many times they'll have uh, lawyers sitting up there kind of doing uh, judge work. Um, in, in pretty some much cases. all judges are attorneys. Well, they right? are attorneys, right? But uh, sometimes they'll have people who are practicing also doing judge stuff. Have, have, has true. any of that ever fallen to you? You mean uh, practicing attorneys being appointed to be a judge? Not appointed, but so much are as you just... asking if Stefan has done judge Have you ever sat up there? <laughs> Uh, only in moot court okay. <laughs> at law schools. I see. Pretending to be an international law judge. I, yeah, I just I, sometimes they, you know, the 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 ones that seem to be so more servile will uh, get an opportunity to sit up there and uh, just play judge, and then they have to go back to work after that. It, it's what I've what I've seen. Well, I mean, I think the main types of judges are the ones in states which are usually elected, so they have to be politicians, or the ones that are appointed in the federal system, so they have to be somehow part of the establishment, right? They have to be appointed by by the president. Uh, so they're always servile to a degree, but even the good ones, even if you want to do justice, they just don't have the ability to do it. Uh, the thing is, statutes are notoriously vague quite often. Oh, yeah. And they're vague because they're not objective, because they're just decrees of a legislature, and quite often – uh, ambiguous terms will be put into legislation on purpose because that's how a political compromise was reached between the two or three or four different special interests. They just mm -hmm. want to get a, a bill out there to get credit for it, and they figure we'll just pump this to the courts. They'll figure it out. Like the, the Americans with Disabilities Act says you have to make reasonable accommodation for people with a disability. I love that term, no reasonable. No one knows what it means. It's just re So it's up to the judges, right? and the judges have to make a decision in a given case, and – so there is sometimes wiggle room, and when there's wiggle room, then that's when the ju the lawyers, the advocates on both sides, have a leeway or an opening to try to make moral arguments, to try to get this sort of justice-based fairness-type concerns into yeah. the judge's minds. But they're just trying to push them or nudge them l a yeah, little bit too little, too that late. I mean, the system is is messed up, and a lot of the times these uh, you know these legislators are attorneys as well, and so they're essentially just writing themselves new business. It's a lawyer industrial complex. Well, I, I certainly think that's true, of course. Uh, but th the problem is not the fact that there are lawyers in politics, or that lawyers are the uh, uh, the executives, even or the judges. Um, you know, the problem is the conception of law is emanating from a sovereign or a source. Instead of it having a root in some natural, intuitive sense of justice or the mm. natural laws, we sometimes would call it. So, the very idea of legislation corrupts and perverts the idea of law. Can you give me some idea of some something you'd rather see in its place um, sort of from a ju judicial standpoint? Well, I mean if you have a state system, it's never going to be – uh, uh, perfect. Uh, so even in the common law, that it's was never going to be perfect. We, as long as you have humans involved, I suppose perfection's out of the window. Correct. But what my, my point is that even if you have a decentralized, like common law system, uh, like the common law or the ancient Roman law, by the way. So one misconception people have is that uh, they think of the common law as this kind of decentralized, kind of free market type system. In reality, you had the Roman law, which was older, which was a decentralized system as well. And then you had the common law come about later, which is a second decentralized system. All right, Stefan, hang on. Let's continue this discussion. I want to talk more about what is common law. I mean, honestly, there's a bunch of people that call in and they blather on about common law, but what does it really even mean? 855-450-FREE. Uh, that's our toll-free number. Maybe you've got a question for Stefan Kinsella. 855-450-3733, live Sunday edition of Free Talk Live.
This is Free Talk Live, the live Sunday edition continuing now. We've got Stefan Kinsella with us, uh, attorney. He's into a lot of the intellectual property arguments. Normally that's what we've talked about with him in the past. He is against intellectual property. And his blog, stephankinsella.com, I believe. Do I have that right, Stefan? That is right. That's S-T-E-P-H-A-N, Stefan Kinsella, K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A. We'll put a link on our Facebook and uh, Twitter for you as well, so listeners can check that out. We'll continue talking with uh, Stefan about what is law here in a moment. Yeah, but um, what we found, what I found for my family is I found a way to handle this uh, Obamacare law in a way that uh, is beneficial to me. So what it is is it's Liberty Health Share, and it's a health sharing organization as opposed to an insurance company. And you know, insurance companies obviously they take in money and they um, you know pay out to people who need it. But the health sharing organization they do that. They allow you to work with uh, families individually. It cuts out all the overhead. And for my family, it was about half price. So um, I would encourage you to go to libertyhealthshare.org. Now, obviously, if your company's paying for all your health insurance, I guess you got nothing to worry about. You know, cut, hit your co-pays or whatever. But if you've got to do your own health insurance, check them out. LibertyHealthShare.org. And the number is 855-58-LIBERTY. 855-58-LIBERTY. LibertyHealthShare.org. All right. So, so back to Stephen Kinsella from StephanKinsella.com. Uh, Stephen, you were talking about law and what it really is. Mark used the term law when he mentioned Obamacare, but that's not a law, right? A statute, that's, right? That's a uh, U.S. code. Isn't that what they call it? Well, that's that's right. That's part of the United States Code, so it is a type of statute, and basically all of federal law is statutory law. There, There's something called federal common law, but it's not really federal common law. So uh, even the Constitution, people think of as being this majestic document, is really just legislation. It's a little bit more elegant, a little bit more general than most particular legislation, but even the Constitution – is, is a legislated document, right? something decreed by somebody which has some kind of authority. Mm-hmm. In, the, in the states and the state courts, which are more similar to the English courts, the judges have this body of common law which developed over time in England primarily and Rome before that, uh, which was the result of judges deciding cases, and then their decisions were considered – uh, precedential, right? So that is – it's called stare decisis, which means one court that comes after is supposed to follow the result before unless there's a really good reason uh, not to. So in this way, law develops incrementally over time as judges and courts try to find just solutions to problems that real people have. And you're but saying that it, would be it, what common law is? That's what common law is, but okay. what's happened over – in the last 100 or – plus years is that legislation has become more and more the dominant source of what's called law. That's the results, uh, the rules that the courts will give effect to and that the executive branch of the government enforces. So at this point in time, uh, you could look at common law unless a statute has over, overridden it, right? And that's more and more of the place, mm. uh, more and more of the case. Statutes govern almost every area of law now. So statute law has become the dominant source of law, and that's how so, people think of law now. How does one – okay, so I see what you're saying. So without the statutory law, then there would be common law. How would one determine what common law is? It doesn't seem well, that common so, to me, I guess. So ju- what happens is, especially in appellate courts, is that an appeals court case is where the judges are really looking at what the law should be, where there's a legal dispute, not just the question about the facts like who committed this act. Um, the judges usually announce their opinions in a written decision, and over time, those are collected in what's called cases, and people can read them. And then legal commentators like Blackstone or other specialists in the law, they will codify them. They will write private uh, treatises. This is done in America now even today with the American Law Institute. It's called the Restatements of Law. Of course, the Restatements of Law nowadays summarize not only the common law that's developed but also the statutory law that's encrusted and grown up around it. But it sounds in a like a market, mess. <laughs> it is a huge mess, which is one reason attorneys – there are so many attorneys, and they get paid a lot, and it's hyper-specialized, and it's harder for the common person to know what the law is. Even no the doubt. government doesn't really know what the law yeah, is. Yeah, most of the enforcers themselves don't even know what the law is. There have been multiple times or what, even what their statutes say. 
they, you know, usually have to look up stuff before they can even bring a criminal charge. They'll arrest somebody and then figure out later what they uh, what they are arresting them for. Um, and, but Mark, you and there's so many laws they can choose which ones they want to use to go after whoever their their current victim right. is. And I know Mark has a question, but I, I was curious since we're talking about these different types of law. People call this show these legal theorists call the show all the time. I guess not all the time, but often enough over the years. And they bring up this thing about maritime law that uh, there's right. this gold fringe on the Ad, flag. Admiral, ad, admiralty oh. law too. Admiralty. What's the admiralty, difference? Yeah. Is there a difference? Admiralty law, maritime law, whatever they you know they say this is like the law of the high seas, but yet it's in our courts. Is that a total conspiracy theory? What is what's what's your thought on that? I, I think it is a it's a it's a total conspiracy theory. These are the common law court types, and they they use the term common law as well. Mm -hmm. They think there's some significance to whether your name's in all capitals, but. Right. These people have also succumbed to the fallacious view of law because they think of law as what's been written down and decreed by the legislature, which is why you'll hear like an income tax protester. Now, I'm an income tax protester because I think the law is uh, immoral and illegitimate, but I wouldn't – I wouldn't deny that you will go to jail if you don't pay your income taxes. So it is a law right now. It's just a, an immoral law or a bad law, but you will hear these income tax protesters if you say – it is actually illegal to evade income tax. They will say, show me the law. You hear this all the time. Now, that's a, that's a legislative mentality. They want you to show them in what they call the law books. They want to see it written down in black and white. Basically, they want you to show them a decree from the legislature which shows them what the law is. So even they are thinking of law as what comes from the legislature. Mm -hmm. But yeah. what they really mean is show me the, uh, the statutes that somehow obligate them to pay, right? I, I think so, but the problem with that is, you know, the statutes are so vague. Not in income tax, actually, they're not that vague. But in general, the statutes are so myriad and complex and vague that all we can really know is what Oliver Wendell Holmes, the famous Supreme Court justice, said. He had what he called the bad man theory of law, and he said if you want to know what the law is, you have to think like a bad man. And he would only try to predict what a court would do if he went before a court, and that is really where the rubber hits the road, right? What are courts going to do? So what the Constitution means is what the court says because that's really all it comes down to in today's system. It's basically naked force of the state against people. So whatever yeah. the rules are that the, the courts and the executive actually enforce is what you could say the law is. I like what uh, Mark Stevens' definition, a law is an opinion backed by a gun. Yeah, okay. that's exactly right. I agree with that. So, Mark, you had a question for Stefan. Yeah, this one um, – this is sort of the second part of the, the email that you wrote me, and I think that um, – it, I think there might be a point of contention here, so let's go for it. Um, there's sort of uh, – you, we were talking about what, how we would uh, – if in, in the case of a multimillionaire that perhaps Bill Gates. broke the law, right? And Poor Bill Gates. Um, he always gets used to these young samples. So the, we have a murderous Bill Gates out there, and perhaps he goes uh, out uh, deciding to kill people because in our new system of restitution, <laughs> um, all he has to do is restitute, say – maybe say he's calling ki – killing homeless people the restitution on them is real low or whatever and so he's just like yes i get to kill lots of people because they're cheap they're only thirty thousand right. dollars a piece right and right you had uh, some kind of <clears throat> way that you thought that might be dealt with and you can tell us that in a moment stand by uh stefan kinsella <laughs> is with us via skype sounding good by the way you can join us via skype as well skype username is lrn.fm but if you've got a question for stefan call toll free at 855 450 free if you want to play online poker with bitcoin you need a site that's trustworthy and technically sound the site managers of swcpoker.eu have proven their commitment to bringing you great gameplay from a site you can trust swcpoker.eu they have lots of new games too including chinese poker and their krill leaderboard is open right now it's a beautiful site easy to use with lots of players go on over to swcpoker.eu EU now and have some fun with your Bitcoin. SWCPoker.eu. This is Free Talk Live. It is the live Sunday edition. Of course, you're welcome to join us here on the radio waves at 855 450 free, especially if you've got a question for Stefan Kinsella. He is with us here from StefanKinsella.com. He's an attorney and, as you might imagine, has some opinions about the law. Uh, so we're going to continue with that. Also, if you want to later, you can call us on Skype at Skype username LRN.FM. How would you like to save 20, 25 percent, maybe even more on whatever you want to buy on Amazon? Because you can do that. The trick is you got to get Bitcoin and then 
or first, whether you get the Bitcoin first or not. You can go to save at purse.com. Now, if you've got Bitcoin, then you can load it up at saveitpurse.com and instantly start going out to Amazon and ordering the stuff that you want. And uh, there's actually a Purse Instant that allows you to get stuff without having to wait. But if you want the big discounts, the 20%, 25%, possibly more, I got 29% off these headphones I'm wearing. Uh, if you want the big discounts, you do have to wait for a little bit. You put your order in and then somebody will fill it for you. You can watch the video. It's super easy to do. It's like two minutes. video is very short, two or three minutes or something. Save at purse.com. Just go there and get started. When you sign up through our link, save at purse.com, Free Talk Live will get a very small portion of each of your future purchases through saveitpurse.com. Speaking of Bitcoin, and as an endorsement for Stefan Kinsella, I've actually paid him Bitcoin oh, really? uh, for, for uh, services. And I think he's the only, probably the only lawyer I've paid in a decade. Wow. Okay. Well, that's cool. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Stefan, you're back on Free Talk Live. You were, I think, Gearing towards a point about restitution when we went away? Yeah, let, let me see if I can summarize kind of quickly. Uh, what you guys had talked about on the previous show was the, the so called millionaire problem, right? Like, if we have, I mean, you were talking about the problems with the punishment based system, although Mark was talking about, you know, maybe people would be in prison working off their debts, that kind of thing. Um, I think there are serious problems with that. Randy Barnett has written about that. The costs of a punitive system are very high. Uh, I do think in some special cases you have to lock people up or banish them somehow because they're just standing threats to the community. But by and large, I think a restitution-based system is what would tend to evolve, both because it tends to rehabilitate people, gives them a way back in. It's cheaper to administer, all those kinds of things. That said, I think that libertarians have an intuitive sense like most people do that basically punishment or some kind of retaliation or retribution is sometimes justified. So the way I would put this… Is that restitution is not really the primary right that victims have. Retribution actually is the primary right, and I've written on this before in my my rights theory, my punishment theory. Why is that? Basically, well, because the victim basically has the right to do back to the aggressor what they've done to them. And I have a, a theory I call a stopple, which is an old common law concept, a stopple, which means you can prevent someone or stop them from saying something in a court or an official proceeding if it contradicts what they've said before. And my libertarian sort of take on that or insight is that if you've committed aggression against someone, you really have no grounds to complain if something similar is done back to you, which is basically the idea between eye for an eye or the mm -hmm. lex talionis, right? the right of retribution. So in my view, the whole basis of libertarian rights is based upon the right of the victim to have retribution or to retaliate against his uh, aggressor. There was a recent now, case out of Iran where a woman had uh, acid thrown in, in her face and was blinded by a suitor, um, that uh, a sperm suitor, and uh, she, instead of doing a whole variety of things, including prison and uh, restitution and all these sorts of things, she demanded that the court put acid in dude's eyes. And um, so, What did the court do? Yeah, they put acid they in his eyes. That. From what I understand, I'd have to go check uh, you know, the news story. But as, as I was hearing it, it, basically she wasn't going back on her work. Now, Stefan, aren't you hearkening back to barbarism here? I mean, don't we want to move ahead, even though what you're saying is probably true, that you know, eye for an eye seems very justified in a lot of cases, and I can understand why people would want to get retribution. It feels like some sort of catharsis, I guess. I, I feel like ultimately it would be very, very uh, unsatisfying. I'd rather have but a check. Uh, and there's that, yeah. And uh, yeah. so, I mean, uh, why are yeah. you going uh, to bat for that? I guess. Well, so you no, know, what I'm, I'm, I'm actually agreeing with you. I think that in practice, especially in a free market system, that this actual administration of punishment would be too costly and it would be too counterproductive to be, to be really systematically enforced or institutionalized. I think a restitution system would be what would be put in place. But my point is that that seems like the more humane system to me. I mean, as I they think say, it would be. Yeah, and he's saying it's more likely, likely to blind and all. He's so. saying he's saying it's the more likely to. Mm -hmm. Yes, but my point is that getting back to the millionaire problem, that if the primary right of the victim is to basically punish their their aggressor, what they would tend to do is use that right and they would negotiate with the aggressor for some kind of restitution payment. And if you had a millionaire like uh, Bill Gates, who was a, a, some kind of sadist, and he thought he could go around and just commit murder and just pay the victim's families off, that wouldn't happen because there wouldn't be like a fixed award set by a legislature, like a right. schedule of fees, right? It wouldn't say a life is worth $3 million, and that's yeah, all Yeah, that sounds is. really cold. 
Yeah. So rather what would happen is you would negotiate, and so if a billionaire commits murder, then the victim's family could negotiate with him. They say, listen, we have the theoretical right to subject you to torture and put you in prison for life or to execute you, and because he's a billionaire, he might be willing to pay $500 million or maybe $10 billion to get his way out of it. So there wouldn't be a fixed penalty for crimes. It would depend upon the circumstances, and so the millionaire problem that you alluded to would basically disappear. Because you're talking about the eye for the eye basis of this, I have no dispute um, with it. I do. Uh, there's some Scandinavian country that um, charges people speeding tickets based on how much they're worth. And sometime, like a decade ago, some dude got like a hundred thousand dollar, ten thousand dollar speeding ticket. I don't know what the number was, but it was a large speeding ticket, basically because it was worth a great deal. And from a legislative standpoint, sort of going after somebody on a sliding scale punishment that bothers me. But when it comes to, um, you know, the right of the victim to uh, essentially uh, enact upon the aggressor uh, what they'd have done to them, then I can see why that would be an issue. So if Bill Gates, for instance, stole $100 um, out of the, you know, the wallet, my wallet just sitting around on a table from me, he'd be liable for $100 and perhaps a punitive amount. But that punitive amount wouldn't be that big of a deal uh, because it's, you know, it's just still a punitive amount. However, if he did something to harm me bodily, I essentially am able to go into negotiations with him and say, look, $100,000 is not enough for a broken leg, dude. And poor Bill Gates, he does not deserve this kind of, uh, these, these analogies. But um, so in your case, you owe me significantly more than $100,000. I'm going to need to see $10 million, Bill. Get yeah, out your checkbook. Exactly. So, so I, I get it from a, that it, standpoint. It wouldn't be a decree by the legislature, a sliding scale set by the legislature. This would be the result of private negotiations based upon the victim's objective right to retaliate in like fashion to what the aggressor has done to them. And it just seems hard to me to say that uh, inflicting re- retaliatory – force upon an aggressor like he's done to the victim really violates his rights. Now, I do agree mm-hmm. it's barbaric and that probably we wouldn't see that put into practice on a wide, widespread basis, but even if you didn't have it in practice, you could tell the jury. So right now the juries have no standard whatsoever. You tell the jury just – you tell us how much the damage it should be for what was done to this victim, and they just make up a number, $10 million, $1 million. At least you could tell the jury you should imagine in your head what would – what would have been negotiated if punishment was an option? So at least there's some objective standard the jury could take into account. Stefan, I really appreciate you coming on to talk about this yeah. uh, with us here tonight. Very informative. I like what you have to say. And you do have a blog. It's stefankinsella.com. Looks like you're updating it relatively frequently. I do, and I also blog on intellectual property stuff uh, on c4sif.org, C, the number 4sif.org. C4SIS or F? F. Uh, Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. C4, the number four. S-I-F. Right. Got it. Um, I'd like to say that I often, um, you know, when when I... I go after Stefan Kinsella's uh, bigger articles for the intention of sort of finding a basis uh, intellect- uh, intellectually and philosophically. Um, I think that he, he often parses out on a very detailed and minute basis um, issues that it, it appeals to me for writings. If people have similar um, you know, desires to look at liberty issues in this way, Stefan's writings are worth uh, taking into consideration. Stefan, thanks again for coming on Free Talk Live tonight. StefanKinsella.com, his website. You can join us here. Our toll-free number is 855-450-FREE. Now, it is uh, the live Sunday edition, and that means it's the same as always. Open phones about whatever you want to discuss. Coming up, the puritanical glee over the Ashley Madison hack. Maybe the Koreas are going to war. Troops are on alert. Uh, There's a lot that we can talk about, but you can also join us. 855-450-FREE. This is Free Talk Live. This is Free Talk Live. Ladies and gentlemen around the United States and around the globe today took off their tops at various different locations, including Times Square, where over 300 or around 300 uh, bare chest demonstrators were parading. We'll talk more about Free the Nipple, uh, that campaign, here in a few moments. And if you are there and you want to enlighten us as to what it was like, 
feel free to call us up. Toll free number. I imagine it was like being around a bunch of people without shirts on. Yep, eight fifty five four fifty free. Well, I hope that's all it was. I Mark, wonder what the some... nudists um, think about this stuff. You know, like they're wandering around with no clothes on at all, and it's uh, just kind of like, is it like watching a kid on training wheels? You know, so proud of themselves. Well, nudists generally aren't walking around in public with no, no clothes on. They not. have nudist parks and beaches for that purpose, Mark. Sure, uh, but I would suspect I'm aware of how nudism be, works. I would suspect nudists would be very supportive of this. So if you want to join us here, our toll-free number is 855-450-FREE. Let's go to Sarah, listening in Virginia. Uh, Sarah, you're on Free Talk Live with Ian and Mark. Hi, thank you so much for taking my call. Sure, go ahead with your thoughts. I just wanted to see what you thought about a situation that happened today. I tried to send money to um, a friend's mom in need, and... The company, I don't know if I'm allowed to say, but the company um, pretty much made me wait for four hours. You, you can say what their name really is. High. We'll just say allegedly in front of the company. So what was the alleged um, company? MoneyGram. MoneyGram. Money they okay. said I could send money within minutes. <laughs> and so I proceeded with the application. And yet it, it kept saying that it was processing, processing. Yep. So was I this just a, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I am familiar with both of these organizations, the main two players, MoneyGram and Western Union. Uh, and uh, so I know what this process can be like. Was this your first time ever going through a MoneyGram uh, send? No, it was not. I sent some money to um, a couple of my in-laws hmm. uh, right before Christmas. And how did that and go? I was knew it- that it's. Well, it, it took more than a few minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I was prepared for that. Yep. But, you know, I called them to find out what was going on after an hour. And they said, oh, you know, 15 more minutes and you're up for approval. Okay. So I waited another hour. And overall, I spent two over two hours literally on hold waiting on for phone. someone to talk to me over several different calls. And they kept saying, you're up in line next few more minutes, a few more minutes. <laughs> so at the end of four hours, they send me an email and say they need additional information. Mm-hmm. So I call them and wait on hold another half an hour. And now they want to know, why am I sending this person money? Oh, boy. How, what was the amount, may I ask? And $500. Okay. And for me, then this is why I'm calling you. It's not just a complaint, but... My concern is, isn't that a violation of privacy to ask me why I'm sending someone money? Okay, so, um, well, yes. I mean, it's obviously a violation of your privacy. There's no doubt about that. Um, Can they do that? Yes, they can legally absolutely do that. And, in fact, they probably have to do it legally. There's probably some kind of law that they're following, some sort of know-your-customer uh, legislation that is mandating all money, what they call so-called money transmitters. Now, this is a legal term, uh, but you know it's basically somebody who takes someone else's money and then sends it elsewhere to uh, a third party. Uh, and so these money transmitters are dealing with all manner of different government regulations that are incredibly intrusive and invasive to your privacy. And so odds are good they're doing this simply because they have to in order to obey some kind of government diktat, which would mean, of course, that you have no leg to stand on legally as far as, you know, any kind of threat of a lawsuit or anything like that. This is just how they do business. And it's interesting, too, because usually it's the first time with MoneyGram and Western Union where it's a huge hassle to set up the account and go through all of the you know requirements as far as identification and secret questions. And then they, you know, it takes longer than you expect it to. Of course, whenever a company says it takes just minutes, well, you could have uh, several thousand minutes that you could be waiting. It took for them minutes. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Well, they did say minutes, not hours. So, right. you know. But I just felt like, and I told them, I said, the reason why this person needs the money is none of your concern. It really felt like a violation. <laughs> that probably set off yeah. some uh, some red flags right there. So it, it, did it ever transfer through? Did it ever happen? Oh, no. No, they refused. Right. Yeah. I said, my reason is that she needs money and I'm helping her. Well, then they asked, are you going to be sending her more money in the future? I said, well, I, I doubt it, but definitely not today. You know, and the reason is 
she's getting evicted. It's a friend's mother. Oh, man. Yeah. You know, she's been through a lot. She lost her husband yep. recently. Usually when somebody needs money, someone. Graham, it's because it's urgent. Yeah, there's right? a big deal going on uh, generally. Right. Somebody needs money because something's happening that needs to be dealt with immediately. And so people are willing to pay incredible fees and they're willing to jump through these ridiculous hoops holding for hours at a time just just so they can send uh these federal reserve notes these u.s dollars from one point to another through this old money system and sarah are you a new listener to free talk live no i am not i i listen to you actually we only get your show on saturday night right ah, okay now, so you're calling show on, you're calling in but... norfolk yes so, well, thank you, by the way. I, I, wanna, I thought of you guys. It's yeah. a violation of privacy. Well, like, there's, you know, another really reason, uh, that, there's another reason that you need to, to consider here or something to consider, and that is that you don't want to put your money in the hands of these old companies anymore. These guys, they are so bad at customer service. They're so expensive. Uh, what was the fee, if I might ask? You sent $500. What was the fee to actually send that 500 Even though you didn't get to send it. Well, that. right, even though it didn't happen. Do you know? Do you remember well, what it would? Well, sending it from my bank account was only eleven dollars and fifty cents. Okay, but going through another company would have been forty-five dollars. So you know, it can so, be done for a relatively affordable amount if you're willing to jump through the hoops and cross your fingers and hope that they actually, yeah. you know, approve the transfer. And then, by the way, there's also issues with the person picking it up. So if if you uh, send the money and you're successfully able to send it, but your person on the other end, let's say they don't have a government driver's license, well, they can't go and pick that money up. So it's just going to sit there. And there's, so there's all kinds of ridiculous requirements on them, too. What you're getting to, Ian, is Bitcoin. Yes, so that's right. um, if for whatever reason you were able to, uh, you know, you had some Bitcoin and you could send it to um, this, this friend and this friend could pay their rent in Bitcoin, then it would have cost you minutes and literally taken you I mean, second, tens of no, it's seconds. Not, yeah, it's not minutes. You can you can send no, I'm Bitcoin. Sorry, I, and I it's meant to say pennies. I meant to say pennies, and literally, um, it would have cost you pennies to send, and it would have. By pennies, I mean two cents, three cents, um, to send wow. it, and it would have taken you tens of seconds to uh, go log into your Bitcoin yeah. wallet, log into the account, and send the. Uh, the uh, longest portion would be the logging in. The yeah. actual sending of the money with Bitcoin is literally an instant. I mean, it's, it's confirmed. Uh, it's it's seen on the other end within a, a flash of a it's, moment. Yeah, I always double check though because yeah. the, um, I, I, I'm sorry. I have heard you speak of Bitcoin, but I still don't have a full grasp of what it means. It just sounds like some, you know, bizarre out there concept that yeah. I just. I mean, I'm it's studying that. for my master's degree. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. Right. You know, I, I'm smart, but I still just don't. I just don't. Fully it's grasp there's it a, yeah. There's definitely a learning curve with Bitcoin, and it is a new idea. It is a decentralized money. It is money that is essentially internet money. It was issued by someone anonymous. We don't even know who Satoshi Nakamoto is, and it wasn't created by banks. It wasn't created by governments. And basically, Bitcoin is good for a lot of things. And one of those things it's very good for is transferring money instantaneously around the world to anybody without having to ask permission first. So there's no application wow. process. When, when you go and you open a Bitcoin wallet, it's as simple as downloading. If you have a smartphone, you download an app for your smartphone, open the app, and you've got a wallet. So there's no you know, fee. There's no applying. There's no government bureaucrat that has to approve. There's no you know, requirements for... Uh, just jumping through ridiculous, arbitrary hoops. So I highly recommend you look so closer into it. Hmm? So is it safe as my bank account, my all my information? Is I would say safe? it is safer than your bank account, um, but it's your responsibility to protect yourself with Bitcoin. You are the holder of your own bank account, unless you want to give another company the ability to hold your account for you. There are companies that will do that, like blockchain.info. Uh, but by the default setting you are your own bank essentially with bitcoin so you'd want to protect your bitcoin wallet just like you would protect your real wallet in real life right. and uh it well, works... i have one more question about yeah, that sure. is there a way like is it, it could it potentially be profitable to you know like the, the transfer of funds with bitcoin versus dollars well uh when you say profitable you mean someone making money transferring bitcoin i'm not sure what you're getting at well, yeah, like, you know, exchange rates. Like, sometimes you can make money off of exchange rates with other countries. 
And so I wonder if sometimes... Yes, there are people who play what they call arbitrage, where they buy Bitcoin at one uh, exchange and then they'll sell the Bitcoin at another exchange to make money. There are people that that do that stuff. And they play the market, um, you know, watch it go up, watch it go down. And we'll tell you how to get some Bitcoin here in a little bit. Sarah, check out out, uh, Bitcoin.com if you want to learn more about it. That's a really great website. Hour 2 is coming up. This is Free Talk Live. If worse comes to worst, will you be prepared? You don't have to be a survivalist to prepare for the unexpected. Storing necessary supplies like food, water, and emergency equipment is simply taking responsibility for ourselves and our families when it counts the most. StrategicShelters.com offers emergency supplies and a secure way to store them and provides protection for loved ones in the event of an extreme natural or man-made disaster. To find out more, visit StrategicShelters.com. Free Talk Live. This is Free Talk Live. It's the live Sunday edition. You can join us here. Our toll-free number is 855-450-FREE. That's 855-450-3733. Tonight, you've got Ian. And Mark. Uh, So we were just talking about Bitcoin a moment ago. We had a lady on the line who was having difficulty. I don't want to talk about the topless event here in a little bit. But uh, she was having some difficulty with MoneyGram, which is one of the, uh, the two big players in Moving money or money transmission, as the federal government calls it. Non-banked um, money transmission. So, I mean, yeah. you, know, you can wire money from bank account to a bank account with re- relative ease, and it's uh, relatively inexpensive. Yeah, but that's true. This is sort of uh, moving it's a service money for a yeah, lot of people for who the don't unbanked, have banks, which is a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people, especially in international countries. There are a bunch of people who are serviced by Western Union. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people in uh, the, like New York City, when you're in the right neighborhood, like Chinatown or whatever, every other uh, storefront has, we've got MoneyGram or yep. we've got Western Union. It's either one or the other because people are constantly sending money back home and to family members and things like that. I recently heard a story from a friend who um, basic I think he had an account with Bank of America, and he was upset about a, I think it was an $8.50 charge that the bank had given him and he decided that he was going to take his business elsewhere and screw them um you know mm-hmm. i'm not, i'm not dealing with this kind of customer service and they ruined his credit oh, yeah. over $8.50 ruined it he can't get mm. he can't get a credit card he can't get a bunch of things so you know there's a there's problems with having bank accounts but they have advantages too, so it's really it's a they, they are a double edged sword. You got to be very careful with those things. Those people are gangsters. Well, I mean that's a very gen. Uh, general if I had statement. an eight dollar and fifty cent dispute with a convenience store, I think we yeah. could work it out without destroying my life for the next five no years. Doubt. Maybe you those people those act people. like bank bank. Uh, those banksters act like gangsters. They have uh, they have ends with the government. Okay. They use the monopoly on force to get what they want. Yeah, that's I, true. I will stand behind that terminology. I'm sorry, I'm not going to consider the nice ladies behind the counter at my local bank to be gangsters. You don't I'm think sorry. that the uh, the, the guys nonsense. that run gangs have moms and uh, and, and sisters and aunts? Look, Mark, there are people in the banking industry because not because they want to use their connections with the government to screw people, but because they do want to provide banking services to people, that that's what they are driven if to do. If Edith I mean, that- is involved in ruining someone's credit over $8.50, Edith is a, bank, uh, is a gangster too. Okay. I don't think that the uh, individual tellers are the ones that are making the decision to ruin somebody's credit. I imagine that goes to some sort of review, uh, some kind of, you know, there's somebody in the office that checks that information when they see that there's certain delinquent accounts and then they do certain things. I'm not defending the what they're doing here, Mark, but to just make this blanket statement that all people involved in banks are, are bad people. I didn't say all people involved in okay. banks, but you I'm said, willing to go ahead and go ahead and say that. You, um, the fact wow. is, right, that's exactly what I'm going to say. You work at a bank, you work for gangsters. And if you work for gangsters, got some news for you, you're a gangster. All right? So gangster? I'm gonna be- gangster, yes. They act like gangsters. They operate like gangsters. They're gangsters. Um, I will say that recently there was a court case, uh, I think it was in Germany, where they found the guy that was doing the accounting at Auschwitz or some other camp where they were killing uh, Jewish folks. They held him responsible and found him guilty. He's like 97 years old. The guy was the accountant Uh 
of the camp. He took people's like belongings and stuff like that and, and wrote down what they had. So if they can find Look, this man. guy guilty of murder, of being involved or accessory to, you know, hundreds of thousands of cases of uh, murder, then somebody who works at the bank who's involved in you know, muscling somebody over $8.50 and ruining their life for, uh, you know, five years— yeah. Are the contractors? I mean, look, I'm the first person to say, hey, the government's a criminal gang. It's a criminal enterprise that uh, uses the force of violence to achieve its uh, political and social goals. I mean, Excellent. I, and I'm you are willing to say there. that banks are franchises of the government because they work within the Federal Reserve System. But are, right? if you're going to say that a bank, uh, that everyone involved in a bank is in a gang, then you might as well say the same thing about everybody who ever accepts any government contract. You might as well take, uh, you know, take everybody who's ever worked on a road and also include them in that as well. Like any uh, private construction firm that was hired to build a road or something like that. Are they also gangsters? I don't think so. I think they're, they're benefiting from the monopoly of the state. There's lots of people who are benefiting. Absolutely. Well, what uh, makes the How do the banks uh, qualify as different from everybody else that's benefiting? Banks? How do they qualify? Yeah, I'm not talking about the Federal Reserve Bank, which is obviously a very special bank with special uh, parameters surrounding it, but just the average community bank or whatever. Well, if they go and ruin someone's credit over yeah. $8.50, and by the way, I wasn't talking about a, a community bank. I was talking about Bank of America because I believe mm-hmm. that was the, uh, the the one that was quoted in this uh, well, you story made a as I heard a general statement about bankers. Yep. Okay, fine. Okay. But I understand. Let's run this to the absurd. A one location community bank mm-hmm. that benefits off the Federal Reserve system that doesn't they're hold forced, that they're forced doesn't hold the assets for the amount of uh, loans that they give out. Um, you know the variety okay. of things that are done. The Federal Reserve system's crazy. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, they operate they, within a crazy system and are benefited yeah. in in that way. And they choose to go after a young man who has, uh, you know, a disputed an eight dollar and fifty cent charge mm-hmm. and ruined his credit for uh, five years. Then yes, they follow. They fall okay. into that same category. So you're only and, only if they go after somebody with an overcharge like that is is when they're gangsters. Just not by default, because it's not like you meant everybody who is in a bank is default a gangster. Uh, I think that there are people who run better gangs and worse gangs. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Generally, you know, the the term gang evokes the idea of violence against other. People like threatening violence. Hey, you better you know pay up, or we're gonna make this store look pretty messy. You know, that kind of thing. The, I don't see that with banks okay. uh, necessarily. Your credit rating is really important for sort of doing business in yep. life. You can't get, you can't rent a place, you can't get a cell phone, right. you can't do a variety of things. So when you hold hostage that over again, I'm going to go back to eight dollars and fifty cents. Then yeah, you qualify okay. as Are that you person. Saying all banks in the would same do way that? that a loan shark who says, "Look, I'm going to break your leg if you don't pay what you owe me," is acting like a gangster. Therefore, being a gangster, yeah. Okay, so how many, uh, what should the amount be at which somebody overdrafts an account that uh, and doesn't make good? Punishments they get... should be commensurate mm-hmm. to the crime. Okay. And therefore, I'm going to have to look at each individual case in a case by case basis. Are Experian, Trans Union, heard... and Equifax also gangsters? I don't think so, necessarily. Somebody might be but able to make But they're the ones a... with the credit reports. Somebody might be able to look. It, the credit report isn't what's being held hostage here. There are companies that sell gold, and that doesn't make them bad people just because somebody might steal your gold. Let's go to the phones here. Uh, Rob is in Pennsylvania. I'm still not clear on what you're saying, though, Mark, so you'll have to clarify whether every bank is a gangster or every banker or just the ones that hit people who have $8 in uh, fees. Uh, let's go to Rob listening in Pennsylvania first, though. You're on Free Talk Live. Rob. Hi. Um, it almost seems like... Uh this is may uh, sounds like a like almost like a stage ar- uh, argument between you two because no definitely not stage um, but why would you say that i'd say that cuz i've listened to you ian argue about you know with the robin hooders and the meter maids oh you know these meter maids are supporting aggression they're supporting mm-hmm. the state and yep. then i hear mark making this financial argument about uh, you know the teller being connected to a financial gangster system and i listen to mark's argument and your ar- argument and you really believe the same thing when it comes to government and banking but then you're having a disagreement but then it just it, well, i don't know if we believe I, the same I, thing it sounds to me like mark believes that everyone working for a bank is involved in a criminal gang enterprise and uh, i don't agree with that so i don't think we agree at all and this is definitely not staged i'm not sure what would make you think this could, is staged how could you uh how it seems seems like you're having a disagreement 
to have some to have um, content for the show. I understand that you've um, said that like twice now. I can assure you this isn't staged. He wants to be convinced. If um, if that's I, the I case. don't believe what you're saying, Mark. I'm just curious to try to understand what you're saying. To me, there's a huge difference between somebody who goes around and threatens people on the streets with uh, the theft of their vehicle. Well, they don't actually is, steal them, right? Which is what they call someone who steals them for them. They uh, that is what they do. Uh, that is what a that parking what a park- enforcer does. He just hung up, by the way. Uh, that's what a parking enforcer does. That's totally different than someone that's providing voluntary services at a banking institution. Completely different. And how, Mark, you can say that uh, they're tantamount to one another or similar, I'm still be- bewildered by. So we'll come back here and you can share your thoughts with us at 855-450-FREE. That's 855-450-3733. If we ever stage something on the show, we'll let you know about it. Like there was this one April Fool thing like a decade ago that we did. It's Free Talk Live. This is Free Talk Live. You can join us here. Our toll-free number is 855-450-FREE. Is Mark being hyperbolic when he says that bank employees are working for gangs? I say so. You're welcome to call in and join us here or bring up whatever's on your mind. Still to come, the topless events happening in something like 60 cities internationally today. That was going on. Maybe you were part of it. You can join us here toll-free at 855-450-FREE. Um, so we were talking about Bitcoin earlier, and Ian, you said you were going to tell um, – I can't remember what the, la- the lady caller's name was, but uh, you still t- Sarah. T- um, tell her how to get some Bitcoin. And this is the easiest way to do it. Um, also, it has the lowest fees. It's ExpressCoin.com, lowest I've been able to find. ExpressCoin.com, and they're the best choice for getting your cryptocurrencies. They've got Bitcoin. They've also got Litecoin and Dogecoin and Dashcoin and a few other things over there. They make it fast, safe, easy, and inexpensive. Um, They are a licensed money services business. They get your cryptocurrencies um, to you, and all you have to do is pay with uh, money order or check. You just start off at ExpressCoin.com. It doesn't matter whether you're in the U.S. or Canada. Um, They can make it even, you know, allow you to do it from your smartphone with their app. ExpressCoin.com. Use coupon code F. FTL, as FTL is in Free Talk Live, and you can get up to $40 worth of the cryptocurrency of your choice with for no fee. Zero fee. ExpressCoin.com. Coupon code FTL. All right. So uh, we're going to talk about the topless event that happened here in uh, New Hampshire, New York City, dozens of cities all around the world. You're welcome to join us. But, uh, Mark, we were this is for real. Somebody, somebody called in doubting this discussion that we were having. I'm actually shocked that you would be... So callous towards the people that are working in uh, the banking industry. And it's not a perfect business. It's certainly something that is absolutely a protected class of business by the federal government. There's no doubt about that. But it's not like you can go and open a bank and provide protection services for people's money and various different money services as well. Uh, it's not like you just go and open your own warehouse bank. Remember, we used to have uh, Wayne on the show with us uh, a long time ago, and he knew a guy, I think it was in California, who opened up a warehouse bank. I thought it was in Washington State, but well, the West wherever Co- the it was, West somewhere on the West Coast. He got targeted and shut down because of that. He didn't have FDIC insurance. He didn't go through the typical banking channels. And, you know, that certainly there are certainly bankers who would have supported that man being shut down. Yep. There's, there's no doubt about that. But in the same way that there are people in the radio business who support targeting of pirate radio operators, there are also people in the radio business who, who support the pirate radio operator. So to just paint everybody in banking with this brush of you're a gangster, uh, I've never felt threatened to go to a bank. I've never felt threatened uh, in any way to use their services. They, uh, you know, It is a limited competition industry, no doubt. Out. There's a lot of critiques you can lay on the banking industry, but you know the tellers are not criminals. They're not doing a criminal job. They're not gangsters. The um, so a gangster is uh, somebody who operates a an organization or within an organization that is usually created by legislation. So you know running numbers or uh, prostitution, meaning they're doing something that's illegal. Drug was, running. The well, opportunity was created to make money because the, of legislation. The opportunity was um, you know created uh, be, by legislation, and in the same way, the the government creating sort of regulations on who gets to be a bank and who doesn't, especially you operate. 
operating within their Federal Reserve system is remarkably similar to uh, you know opportunities being created uh, legislatively. So they fit that def and um, you know also a gang is kind of characterized by uh, like the bad gangs and the reason people would use the terminology um, gang characterized by sort of draconian punishments mm -hmm. for stepping over the line. Um, now, uh, in this case that I was talking about, uh, a young man had his had lost his uh, basically had his credit ruined by a bank um, that had uh, ruined it over eight dollars and fifty cents. A dispute over an eight dollar and fifty cents. And this charge. is someone you know. Yeah, this is somebody you know too. Mm -hmm. And we had t he told the story right here in the studio off the air. And I don't want to reveal his name no. because I don't know what his preference is as sure. far as this goes. So over eight dollars and fifty cents, this bank enacted a draconian operating because they have yep. a privilege created by legislation used a draconian um, punishment for sort of stepping uh, you know out against them and that is why I'm using the terminology gangsters mm -hmm. now when you work for that organization and you see this happen once twice, Again and again, yeah. young people's credit being destroyed over and over. And I've heard mm -hmm. stories like this. Again, I mean, I had a girlfriend that had a very similar story. It was some bounce check charges. But, yep. uh, you know, I mean, there has to be a path back. I and agree. when these banks don't have paths back, that's when they operate like a, a gangster, like gangsters do. Yeah. And when you operate like a gangster, you're going to get called gangsters. When you work for that organization over a course of years and you see these things happen again and again and you turn a blind eye to it, yeah, okay. screw you, you're this a gangster. Is what I, but my problem is is that you seem to be just conflating all banks together, calling everybody who's involved with banking gangsters, but then talking specifically about a bank, one bank in specific. No, this is two banks. Remember, uh, two I gave banks, you another ex uh, right. example. Okay. There are one banks. was a local bank and yeah. one was a national okay. bank. You're talking about banks that have not created a path back, allegedly. We don't know. We didn't ask this person who you're referring to, at least I don't recall that part of the conversation, of well, what would it take to you know make things right. Said he couldn't get another account with them. I knew a guy who was ha had banking issues, and that bank wanted $400 for the path back. So there was a path back. $400 uh, for an $8.50? No, 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 no. I, no, I wasn't talking about that guy. That's I was the talking kind of thing I see, else. though. I don't know what the amount was that he was uh, in arrears, okay? okay? I don't know. I don't know I that. don't know either. All I'm saying is there was a path back. You were acting like there's never a path back, and maybe there is in some cases, and maybe there aren't in others. I don't know. It would be interesting to actually have somebody who works in banking to call in and talk about this, because... You know, they also are dealing with a bunch of scummy people a lot at banks who are trying to take advantage of the system and are, you know, crooks and are actually engaging in fraud. So there is a, there is a reason why some of these punishments exist. Are they all, uh, you know, used justifiably? Probably not. But to say that just because some banks have done those things that all banks are equally as bad or all banks are somehow criminal enterprises seems like you're, you're really stretching. Well, I, look, Ian, if there's this magic bank out there that has reason reasonable fees for reasonable problems, then I'm for that. But that is me giving an opinion. They still operate in a system that has been created by yeah. legislation that gives them an advantage over, say, me opening a bank in competition and not asking the so federal government. So does everybody government. in every le uh, legislated area. I mean, the, anything with a license, they're protected, too. I agree with you. So let's. You so know, are plumbers a uh, criminal enterprise, too, because they've got a license? I don't they're think in a cartel. I don't think that they do if they operate a business that, um, you know, like I gave two points, right? The yeah. two things that characterize your business as a gang, which is that it is yeah. essentially created as legislation and that you have sort of draconian uh, punishments for crossing you. Neither of those hey, things are definitions of a gang. You're just making that crap up. That's, I, maybe that's your definition of a gang, but the actual definition of gangster, for instance, you were talking, you called them gangsters specifically earlier. The uh, dictionary definition, according to the free dictionary, is a gangster is a member of an organized group of criminals, a racketeer, a member of a gang of delinquents, a member of an organized gang of criminals, especially one who resorts to violence. Okay. So there's no violence involved in forcing people to go out and get a bank account or to use the banking services. You the, don't need to do it. There's a there's a system in place that that's like saying, hey, look, um, you know, as long as uh, you know, if you use the roads, you're not a libertarian, and that's a it's a specious I argument. Say that. I, I wouldn't either, but we have, you have to have a bank account to operate. That's our toll-free number, 855-450-3733. And no, you don't have to have a bank account to operate. There are people living off of Bitcoin completely.
Are you searching for your soulmate? Someone you can trust, who will never betray you, or cooperate with the NSA? Stop searching. With EasyDNS, you found a keeper. EasyDNS does it all. Domain names, web hosting, and managed WordPress hosting. EasyDNS stands up for your internet freedom. And with servers in Canada, they do not cooperate with the NSA. Go to EasyDNS.com. You'll love their services or get a full refund. They guarantee it. And they accept Bitcoin. That's EasyDNS.com. This is Free Talk Live, and you can join us here. The toll-free number is 855-450-FREE. That's 855-450-3733. And you can also join us online. Just go to freetalklive.com. Please enjoy the features that we have for you there. If you get online, whether it's through your smartphone, tablet, laptop, desktop, whatever you use, Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, Linux... We can help you protect yourself online. You can use ProXPN. It is a virtual private network. They encrypt your online data, which means that your bank or anybody else that might be trying to snoop on you on the Internet will not be able to do so uh, effectively because you'll be encrypted through ProXPN. ProXPN.com. Now, I should clarify, you're not encrypted when you reach the bank, so that's probably not uh, an accurate thing to say. People who might be trying to steal your bank account information, however, would be uh, flummoxed by ProXPN, as well as anybody trying to monitor you. So your internet service provider will not be able to steal your information either when you use ProXPN. ProXPN.com. Use code FTL50, and you can get 20, uh, 50% off the regular monthly price for the lifetime of the account when you buy an annual account with that code FTL50 at proxpn.com by the way they don't keep any logs of your activities whatsoever at proxpn and they've got more servers than ever before they're using open vpn the gold standard of network encryption it's the real deal and it works well proxpn.com use code ftl50 and take back the privacy that is your right whether you want to comment on the banking controversy here or toplessness you are welcome to do so. Let's uh, go into the Daily Mail story about what happened today all around the globe. There was a lot of coverage given to Hampton Beach in New Hampshire, uh, the Free the Nipple campaign. GoTopless.org, however, is also involved, and they're the ones who are organizing dozens of events all around the globe today, on uh, this, this Sunday, as we're doing this live edition of the show. According to the Daily Mail, bare-chested protesters took to the streets of 60 cities around the world on Sunday, that's today, as part of a campaign to free the nipple. One of the biggest events for Go Topless Day was a semi-naked parade through New York City where officials are debating whether topless tip seekers should be allowed in Times Square. There's been an issue recently with topless women, uh, I guess, offering themselves as photographic material. Uh, You can, you know, Get your picture taken with a topless girl. It's, in that's Times kind Square. of an interesting issue because, I mean, you know, do we want Times Square turned into essentially an impromptu nudie bar? Uh, I mean, many of the <laughs> many of these nudie bars make make their money by gals who are wearing very little, including uh, you know nothing on up top, and then they you know kind of give you a private dance, which mm-hmm. is you know tantamount to gyrating against you. I don't think that's happening. Uh, I haven't heard that Not about yet. Times Square. Uh, but I think that the person who's arguing against this would say... That's what's next. What's next? And, you know, I wonder what the answer would be of anybody who's supporting uh, the sort of the, the Free the Nipple campaign. Is, is it okay for people to... Uh, d- you know, rub up against each other. I think public displays of affection are okay. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly something that some people are going to look at as tacky. Uh, it's something that a lot of people are going to be uncomfortable about. But ultimately, I think people should be able to express affection uh, publicly. Well, I think that uh, public displays of affection today can already be pretty classless and kind of grody. Mm-hmm. And that, um, you know, I, I can see the point that people might have um, that are against this campaign. Rachel Jesse is an actress and model who leads the Go Topless group in New York City. She explained that Sunday's topless campaigners want women to have the same right as men to go topless in public. She says our goal is for gender, uh, equal gender topless rights to be enforced worldwide, freeing women's nipples, she said. Now, in some places like New York City, Hampton Beach here in uh, New Hampshire and other places, it is legal to actually be topless as a female. In fact, gotopless.org 
on on their website where it shows a map of the different events that are happening all around the globe. There are indicators on the map whether or not it is legal in each location uh, for the, the protesters to actually be topless. So there are still a lot of places where this is illegal, and there were cities in which it is illegal where people did protest uh, today. Daily Mail has a whole lot of photos. We'll post this link on our Facebook and uh, Twitter here in a little bit. Yeah, thinking about my argument there um, about the uh, you know the the public um, nudie bar, I don't think that it's likely. So, and the reason is you don't is, think it's likely someone's going to start grinding uh, on another person for a five dollar tip. I think uh, for five, I definitely think they're not. But uh, let's let's call it twenty. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know what they're tra- these ladies are charging something for these photos on uh, the yep. streets. So I don't imagine it's twenty, but I could be wrong. Well, um, my understanding, that's what private dances cost in uh, these sorts of clubs. I haven't been in one in a very long time. So regardless. Street dancing is going to be cheaper, though, right? Like, I know. don't know the answer, yeah. Ian. Um, you know, like I, but I, do, I think that it's unlikely because there are nudie bars in America where the girls wear, have to wear something up top. And that wearing something up top is currently legal on Times Square, right? Like you can wear a very thin bikini on Times Square. You can be that's topless. That's legal. In New York City. Fine. Um, whatever it is, is that you don't see a lot of it happening with because of it's not because of toplessness that this is not occurring. It's not occurring already. What's not occurring? People the being topless? dry docking is not occurring oh. with bikinied women, I let alone topless women. I got you. Dry, dry docking being a slang term for a, a lap dance. Something like that. Gotcha. I prefer uh, not to go into it. Police in mid, uh, mid-Manhattan blocked off several streets to traffic, so around 300 topless protesters could parade throughout the city. Appearing bare-breasted has been legal in New York since 1992, but Mayor Bill de Blasio and public or police commissioner Bill Bratton are now trying to get semi-nude painted women banned from the city's Times Square. The women, like many costumed characters in the square, pose with tourists to get tips. But de Blasio... And, and they're less uh, interesting, um, or more interesting, depending on your preference. But, I mean, like, these these characters, they spend time getting dressed up. I mean, when somebody's yeah. uh, spraying themselves all over in, uh, you know, shiny paint or whatever, they're also, I think, shortening their lives. It can't be good for you to do that. Um, but No, that lady died in Goldfinger because of that. <laughs> um, Skin can't breathe. You... Uh, you <laughs> These people are are doing a great deal. Um, the gals are taking their shirts off. I guess they're born with uh, with their assets, so you know whatever. Governor of New York Andrew Cuomo said the practice harkened to the pornographic, so called bad old Times Square of the past, and uh, he, these people believe that they are a nuisance and are trying to do something to put a stop to these women using their assets to make a little bit of money. Sunday's parade in New York was just one of many events to take place in 60 cities around the world for Go Topless Day. Although they called it Free the Nipple. So there's, I think there's some confusion. There was Free the Nipple in Hampton Beach, which happened on Go Topless Day. And GoTopless.org is different from Free the Nipple somewhat because Free the Nipple is actually a movie about the women in New York who had done this sort of topless activism. Anyway, there were several events. It wasn't just uh, Hampton Beach in Washington, D.C., one woman stood in front of the White House while posing like the Statue of Liberty. One, <laughs> Your arm is going to get tired pretty quickly doing that. It Well, you know, she made it long enough for the photo op. But enough of the picture, yes. Uh, of in Edinburgh, Scotland, around 50 people, mostly women, took off their tops to the city's main street or in the city's main street, the Royal Mile. They staged a sit-in for two hours, much to the amusement of passing tourists and shoppers. Can you have a sit-in um, if you don't actually have a place to sit in, can you have a sit in outdoors? I think it's a form of strike. It would be what it, what it is. But OK, I mean, I get the idea when they say a sit in. I mean, generally, the when I think of a sit in, I think you go into like a politician's office and it's, refuse it's, it's to a form leave. of trespassing almost. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You don't yeah. leave. It's closing time. You're at the office and you're not leaving. I That's think you can sit-in. call it a sit in if you don't have your shirt on because there's an aspect of illegality to it or at least um, sort of counter uh so uh, you know counter mores all right we'll talk more about what happened all around the globe today if you were one of the ladies or gentlemen out in support you can call us up toll free at 855 450 free maddie is on the line in north carolina maddie you're on free talk live hey how's it going guys you're on the radio yes okay so um i work in the finance industry and i just wanted to 
maybe share some of my experience with uh, the audience and, and you guys and, and my perspective. Excellent. I definitely want to do um, that here. So, Stand by. We're going to get to you here, Matty. Uh, he works in the said finance industry. So I don't know if that's a bank. Does that mean he's a gangster, Mark, in your ma- in your mind, if he works in finance? I don't know, man. I'll this let you know. This is Free Talk Live at 855-450-FREE. You can take control of the airwaves. It's Free Talk Live, the live Sunday edition. You can join us here on the radio waves at 855-450-FREE. Whether it's banking or toplessness, we will talk about it here on Free Talk Live. We've got more to say about the Go Topless, Free the Nipple events that were going on uh, globally today. That's still to come. Also, your calls and thoughts about whatever you want are certainly welcome as well. Our toll-free number is 855-450-FREE. We've got Skype. Skype username tonight is LRN.FM. Joining you in studio, it's Ian. And Mark. Don't forget, you can join the AMP program for 5 bucks a month and help get Free Talk Live into more ears all around the globe. And it's really helpful for us when you join the AMP program. So thank you uh, to everybody who has done so. Everybody, whether they're a past amplifier or current, or you're considering it. I really appreciate it. It makes a big difference for Free Talk Live. It allows us to more effectively market this show and get on more stations, bring more internet listeners on board, and you get perks like access to the AMP-only call-in lines, the AMP-only Facebook group, which is a really great group, and more. Go and get all the details and get signed up with any major credit card through PayPal or Visa or MasterCard right over at amp.freetalklive.com. That's A-M-P, AMP, amp.freetalklive. Dot com. We'll go back to Maddie, who says he's in the finance industry. Mark earlier sounded like he was calling all people working in banking gangsters, but he clarified that it's only the people who work for banks that will screw somebody's credit over an eight dollar overcharge. That kind of bank, right, Mark? Dr- draconian, uh, you know, the ways of dealing with customers. And maybe that's all of them. I don't know. But uh, Maddie, you're on Free Talk Live. Go ahead. What What did you want to share? I, I totally get that, and I love the concept of topless banking. I think that that would be wonderful. Yes. Um, now, that is a way that a I bank would, could really uh, I guess set itself apart from the, the competition. I'm surprised that hasn't been tried. Go ahead. Differ, differentiate itself in the, in the market. Yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, so I, I, I work with deposit accounts, and I guess what I wanted to contribute was I see in a lot of instances it is the consumer's lack of education and knowledge on how even basic finance works um, that causes a lot of those types of issues. Um, and, and I'm not trying to justify or condone the actions of the financial institutions. Yes, it's scuzzy. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I, I'm just trying to do my thing, too. I'm just trying to make a little bit of money myself. Yeah, I think that um, people do. I think uh, I think people are ignorant of how uh, you know finance tends to work and these sorts of things. Everybody gets behind um, when it comes to you know bounce checks and and you know sh- shortfalls and and that kind of thing. And it's not like the banks don't try to get that to happen, right? Like they'll make the uh, withdrawals on the day before they make the deposits um, after them, and that's a pretty crappy thing to do. So if, for instance, um, you make a deposit after 2 p.m., Ian. Yeah, I follow. Um, so you make, a, you make a deposit at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and then you go out that night and you make some withdrawals off your debit card at, mm, call it, 11 o'clock at night. There's been many hours between those two things happening, so a reasonable person might assume that, hey, I'm covered because the bank's got this. Mm, you, you, you may get lucky, but it's, it's just as likely, if not more likely, that the bank will say, okay, here's all your withdrawals um, have uh, racked up, and now we'll make your deposit at 9 a.m., and you're, therefore you have uh, overdraft charges, and you know, you've got to pay them. Knowledge this- is power, my friend. Yeah, knowledge is power. There's no doubt uh, about it. I, I, the deposit agreement, the, the contractually binding document that the depositor in- enters into with the deposit institution, uh, when they use the account or use the debit card, clearly defines the, the terms of the contract for that particular consumer. They do make um, it real clear what know, the and, fees and, are. I mean, yep. it's not you know, it's not like it's hidden. They I've just... seen websites that have like really weird things in their terms of service, like they um, you know they want your soul or your firstborn child. Um, do you think that that is a legal and binding <laughs> contract? If you click, I agree to it. 
I, I mean, if if you agree to it, then yeah. But yeah. I, I don't know how okay. enforceable you're it not is. a gangster. Uh, yeah. You're a psychopath. Oh well, come on. I'll I'll agree Seriously, with Mark on if you if you think that the terms of service me clicking I agree and not reading the terms of service means that you get to take my child from me and turn him into say I don't know a, a slave of yours yeah you're a psychopath dude come on dude yes that contract is not binding because it is not fair it's not even really a contract I'm I'm gonna be on Mark's side with this although I think he's being mean with the name calling tonight uh, I I think that in, in the case of these these terms of service. Almost every terms of service that I've ever seen has some kind of statement about how they can change the terms at any time. Some of them don't even require them to give you notice of those changed terms. Now, generally, the banks will give notice. They'll send you a letter uh, full of uh, really t- micro- microscopic right. print that you don't read. Yeah. And so, you know, the, if you can change the contract at any time, you don't actually have a real contract, uh, in right. my opinion. And let me ask you this. If I wanted to send the bank uh, changes of terms to the contract... Do you think that it would be binding in any way? You could try scratching some of the terms it out is, before you sign. There have been there have been decisions out there. Yeah. There have been you click it up, man. There, there's no, he's right. Uh, Maddie's right about that. You can change that, terms. Modified. Yep. Yeah, you and they can you refuse can to accept it. Yeah. You, know, if you, you just won't have a bank account. You can go through the uh, the bank account agreement and cross out the fees if you want to, and they're probably going to say no. But you know, you could in theory try to do something like that. Maddie, I don't think that you're a psychopath. I don't. Uh, you don't think he's a psychopath no, for saying think... that it's okay to take people's kids away? No, he's not <laughs> saying that. Yes, he is. That's not what I say. That's that's a that's a far cry, man. That's rendition right there. I I was speaking tongue in cheek. Just playing double back. All I right, love, man. Thanks, Maddie, for the call. Mark's just in a mean mood tonight. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the call. Our toll free number. You should have gone and seen some breasts today, Mark. Maybe it would have had a calming effect on you. Yeah, Eight fifty five. I got work to do, man. Eight five five four five zero three seven three three. I didn't go either. I didn't go to the Hampton Beach uh, free the nipple yeah. thing. It's two hours to go to uh, you know participate in that event. Yeah, it was a long way away. And one of the things that happened uh, that went wrong, I think, with this particular besides the bad weather here in New Hampshire, it was rainy and kind of cold today at the beach. Uh, but besides that, they canceled the event on Facebook in the morning. And I think that may have uh, contributed to fewer people than who would have come out, uh, or otherwise would have come out, uh, coming out. We'll, co- we'll talk more about the uh, topless event. Uh, Bruce is on the line in New York, or excuse me, not New York City, North Carolina. Bruce, you're on Free Talk Live. Hello, gentlemen. How are you doing? Sir. You're listening in Asheville to WWNC. Go ahead. Uh, I guess you call me old-fashioned, and I do love the female body. But if you're going to have it in a bar or on a, a nude beach, I could go with that. But for women worldwide who want to just walk around, I think it's trashy and slutty. Why is that? Why would you? Is it trashy and slutty when a man does it? For a guy to do it, well, he shouldn't. But it's, it's, I got to say it's different. You got to know why. Why? Because he doesn't have that female. Huh? He doesn't have that female uh, breasts, basically. I, I mean, I don't it. want my. How's that different? My grandchildren walk around looking at these women walking around down the streets in the supermarkets. Aren't you well, just a hypocrite, though, Bruce? I mean, look, there's no difference so. between a man's breasts and a yeah, woman's tell breasts. There's no difference between a man and a woman. I mean, that's you really shooting low here, you know? There is like, no difference besides average size between a man's breast and a woman's breast, and besides the fact that a woman's breast is more likely to lactate. I mean, really, we're talking about baby feeding I tools here. I see them dripping going around the streets. Yeah, well, I think oh, lactation is a, a, is a different morally, issue. I just, it's morally wrong. Morally? Okay, that's my opinion. And uh, as far as Mark laughing at that girl that died in Goldfinger, I think that was pretty pretty bad, Mark. <laughs> I mean, that was terrible. You really trash He's, that he's being nasty tonight. You know it's uh, make-believe, he right? He is. It's make believe. But right? no, I just, I just think the world would be a lot better off if, if people women... kept their tops on. If women kept their tops on, is that what you're saying? Kinda, yeah. I don't understand the hypocrisy though. Why is it uh, okay with you for a man I guess to be you're topless? Not very much of a male, then. Excuse me. I guess you're not very much of a male if you can't see the difference. Uh, I didn't ask you what the difference was. I already told you the difference is that women's breasts tend to be larger than men's breasts. 
There are obviously some men that are exceptions to that and some women that are exceptions to that rule. Um, so that's the difference. That's one of the big differences. But I still don't understand why it's okay for a man to show his breasts. Is it wrong for a man to show his breasts if he's a, a big man? Well, how many men do you see wanting to go around without their shirts on? I see it a lot during the summertime. Well, yeah, that's okay. I think that's okay. We for know you think that's okay. That's because you're a man, right? Well, yes, and yeah. I am. So it's okay for you, but it's not okay for women. Why? Because their breasts are bigger. Well, there are men with big breasts. So why and is small ones? So why is it okay for a man but not a woman, sir? This is real simple. Because it's a sexual organ. Does so that mean speak. you can't control yourself around a woman with uh, her her top off? I just find it disgusting, and to be you think sex like is that. disgusting. No, I told you I love women. Uh-huh. Uh, but, uh, Man, you got some issues. Hey, thanks problem. for the call tonight, Bruce. 855 450 free. That's eight. I love women, but don't you dare go around uh, with your top off. He mentioned grocery stores, and I imagine men can't go in grocery stores with their tops off. 855 450 free. Join us here, Hour 3 of Free Talk Live, coming up. New Hampshire is under quarantine as walking corpses devour the flesh of the living. Max is 11 years old and surviving alone. Slow moving and non-thinking, the dead swarm his home. Now he must apply his porcupine freedom scouts training to improvise his escape. Look for Survivor Max on Facebook, read reviews on Amazon, or read Chapter 1 at SurvivorMax.com. This is Free Talk Live. It is hour number three of the program, live Sunday edition. Of course, we'll take your calls about anything you want to discuss. A lot of people attended at various different cities around the world. The Free the Nipple, a.k.a. Go Topless Day, that was happening in uh, New York City, as well as our very own Hampton Beach here in New Hampshire, where about two dozen women apparently showed up and were topless. I want to talk more about that event because apparently some people feel real strongly about this, even though they can't really explain why. Uh, one guy uh, a moment ago explained to us, tried to explain to us that it's sexual, so therefore women shouldn't. When pressed, he really had to be pressed to get this out of him. Uh, but what, you know, he claims that the difference between a male being topless and a female being topless is that it's sexual for a woman to be topless. But aren't there women out there who go gaga over a topless man with you know a six pack or whatever? Well, I think that uh, you know what is sexual is uh, arbitrary, depends. right? Yeah, <laughs> and there so, are women who go gaga over a topless man, right? If a I've woman, seen this. If a woman wants to, um, you know, if if a woman wants to not wear a shirt, she should be treated under the law the same. Now, most this isn't about necessarily the law as much as it is about societal pressure, and because it's legal in New Hampshire. To be I don't really care topless. what your pre- what your what your preference is if it's not illegal. Like, I think you should be able to in your own mind come up with whatever conclusion you come up with upon seeing somebody without their shirt on that is what a free country is about mm. um, so if men can walk around with their shirts off then so women should, should women. be able to too now obviously it depends on the place um, that they're you know that they're at um, and, and that sort of thing so if a business say wants to let topless men in and doesn't mm-hmm. want to let topless women in I further defend that business's right to that do is business their right that to do. way absolutely so that's all I've got to say. But we're say talking on that. about public property here, not private property. I think most women don't really care about this particular right. Um, I think the vast majority of women are like, you know, no oh, thanks. I'm not going to be going topless, whether or not I get the right to do it or whatever. Yeah. One so, of a, a lady around here that we know says she doesn't. Well, while she supports them, she's not willing to go out and do it because she's worried about what will happen at her job. So a lot of women, I think, support this mark, but they're afraid to come out. And be seen supporting it because of this stigma uh, that is attached to it. We can continue the discussion here, especially if you were actually out at one of these topless events today all around the globe. Would love to hear what the, uh, you know, what was it like for you? Were there a bunch of creepy guys around just leering at you? Uh, Did anybody get arrested? How was the reception from the other people who were around you? Let's continue, though, with your calls and thoughts. We've got Skype. Our Skype username is lrn.fm, and that's where Will Coley is on the line from Tennessee from Muslims uh, for Liberty. Hey, Will. 
Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome. Thanks for having us. Yes, uh, you're um, on the air. Funny enough, this is uh, this this toplessness discussion is uh, uh, a debate that's been going on in society for uh, well over a thousand years. In truth, um, if you look at old historical documents uh, discussing the time of the the Prophet Muhammad living. Uh, there were women from certain tribes who walked around in the marketplaces in Mecca and Medina bare-breasted because it was a, uh, a cultural tradition of that particular tribe. And we know that that's something that continued to happen for well over 100 years after Muhammad's death because you see other scholars like Imam Malik uh, complaining about this practice still continuing uh on into like the 800s. Now, just to clarify something, I mean, the common understanding about a lot of the people, followers of Islam, is that there are very, very restrictive measures. Everybody's got to wear uh, a grain sack over their head. There are very restrictive measures specifically for women and the way that they can dress. And I can't imagine that uh, toplessness is generally considered acceptable in any kind of public or in many, I imagine, private settings uh, in that religion. But it sounds like what you're saying is Muslims were tolerant of uh, those those ladies in that tribe. Well, yeah, because it was their culture. They weren't held accountable to uh, Islamic dogmatic, uh, you know, practices because they weren't from the Muslim community. They were mm-hmm. from a, a specific pagan tribe. Um, most of them are described as Africans. So you have, and you know, we still have some of those African tribes that exist today that you can see, you know, Discovery Channel and National Geographic videos about, you know, these African tribes that still continue to go topless in in the modern day. So you know, the the previous callers, uh, you know, making it out to be uh, uh, trashy or, or you know something of that nature, if. If it's something on a cultural basis, if it's something that a culture sees as, as appropriate, I don't see how you could uh, attach that kind of a connotation to it. And if a person from our culture has decided that they feel that this is something that is liberating for them individually, then I, I, I just I don't see how in a free and individualist society, which America claims to be, that that should be denied to them. They should be denied that ability to say, okay, well, this is what I feel makes me feel freer. This is what me feel makes me feel more comfortable. Did the Prophet Muhammad say it was cool for women to uh, go topless? Well, for Muslim women, Muslim women have a specific amount of modesty that's expected to, of them okay. on a religious basis. But women who aren't Muslim, that doesn't apply to them because, well, they're not Muslim, so why would it? Well, obviously, in certain countries, there are rules for all women, right? And uh, Unfor- yeah, unfortunately, they they decided that they knew better. You know, these are modern political leaders that, rather than deciding to follow the example that was left and leaving different peoples to do what they choose to do, right. they chose uh, a hegemony over principle. So, right. and I've read uh, an excellent book that your friend Davi Barker wrote, "Voluntary Islam." And it really goes into uh, some detail. It's a short book, but it's it's very interesting uh, on how very voluntarist friendly the the true kind of orthodox uh, Muslim belief system is. And what you're pointing out here is that there are certain power seeking uh, people who consider themselves Muslims who are the ones who are enforcing these rules. But the, the s- and that politicians today in the United States apparently are more restrictive than Muhammad was. Yeah, basically. Yeah, I mean, because like I said, this is a, something that yeah. that we know from the writings was taking place during his time when he was alive in the marketplace in Mecca and in Medina and that it was still continuing in the in the time of Imam Malik so at least 80 to 100 years later because he mentions the practice still happening so now we know that not only has was it something that the prophet Muhammad saw in his own time, but it was something that he left alone and those people who came immediately after him who knew him directly also left alone. They didn't outlaw it. They didn't say that, you know, all these women had to cover up and and follow Islamic guidelines like the Saudi government does, that they left it be, that it wasn't their, uh, it wasn't their place because it wasn't their culture kind of thing. About the Saudi government, um, this is something I'm unclear on. Uh, the, The Wahhabists, as I understand it, are kind of 
people that don't necessarily have the sanction of government, but they don't have, but they're not controlled by the government either. So somebody might go out and chase a woman for not wearing a veil or for driving a car or whatever it is that their preference is. And it's not like there's necessarily a law that supports that person. This is my ignorance, by the way, and I'm willing to be corrected. There's not a law that supports that person. It's just that there isn't, nobody's going to do anything to stop them because they've got God on their side or whatever. No, no, no. There are there are actual religious police that are that are endorsed by the state in okay. Saudi Arabia that go around and enforce religious doctrine that comes from the Wahhabi sheikhs, which are um, they're a patrilineal religious uh, leadership. The 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 current al sheikh uh, is a direct descendant descendant of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab al sheikh, and okay. they, there's been a alliance between the family of al Saud and the family of al sheikh for a couple of hundred years and that's was the, that's you know what it looks like part of part of that whole like you know try, validity for each you know like the religious group needed validity through political strength and the political group needed religious validity so they basically created a symbiotic relationship got it that and validated each other but that was you know that was back in like the 1800s when all that stuff happened always good to get the muslims for liberty perspective on things thanks uh will for your call tonight he dialed in on skype you can do the same thing our skype username is lrn.fm so you know that's good to know uh, and that's what i figured would, would would be the case having read voluntary islam great book highly recommend that you can get it over at uh, fpp.cc and you can join us here toll free at 855 450 free you know i'd like to say that um i think it's really great when uh, you know liberty leaders like stefan kinsella and will coley call in to this show there's more coming up here this is free talk live This is Free Talk Live, the live Sunday edition continuing here. Topless events happening all around the globe. Today, the Daily Mail, Reuters, uh, more articles are coming out basically as we speak. There are about four of them before we started the show now. A couple dozen are out there. I'm working on putting one together for freekeen.com. I'm trying to find a, a picture of the ladies where they are not censoring themselves. Uh, there's a photo on the Daily Mail where there's a, li- a line of the ladies that were out in the, on the beach uh, at, uh, at Hampton in, uh, at, at earlier today. Now, apparently the weather was kind of bad, so they actually were underneath some sort of, uh, I don't know, I've never actually been to Hampton Beach, but some sort of covering, there's some sort of covered area. Awning uh, type thing? Yeah, that they were, uh, that they were in. And they're, I imagine the photographers, since they're photographing for these mainstream media publications, they can't allow nudity to be shown in their photograph, so they probably asked them, to cover up, from what I understand, there is a version of this where the ladies are uh, are actually showing uh, you know, their toplessness to the cameras. So I'm looking to find the uh, the uncensored version of it. If you happen to have that, please feel free to send it over to me at ian at freetalklive.com. Since I blog over at freekeen.com, which is an internet based site, uh, there are no such restrictions on me, and so I feel like the whole point of the topless event is for people to be topless and equal about being topless. So should show it as it was, you know, not the censored version of it, if we can. So there's news here from the Daily Mail. I want to continue with uh, what happened all around the the globe today for Go Topless Day, or a.k.a. Free the Nipple, but also Bitcoinist.net is where I want to send you to learn more about Bitcoin. In fact, if you're already into Bitcoin, Bitcoinist.net is great because they are a destination for information about the Bitcoin and digital currency industry, the ultimate resource for Bitcoin industry news, reviews, education, and the latest from the cryptocurrency ecosystem. The Bitcoinist.net website, that's B-I-T-C-O-I-N-I-S-T, Bitcoinist.net. Uh, they integrate a community forum. They've got breaking news for Bitcoin and other digital currencies. Plus, they're covering fintech and blockchain tech news. Whether you're a beginner to Bitcoin, they've got a great beginner's guide. There's also sophisticated Bitcoin network statistics and more. Go to Bitcoinist.net, and it is the platform that serves the need of everyone to look uh, looking to keep up with Bitcoin and digital currencies from beginners to experts. That's Bitcoinist. Dot net. As we go to the phones, to the fun, uh, let's talk to James in Arizona on Skype. Hello, James. Hello, James. Sounds like you hung up. No, he's still there. I'm so sorry, Miss Will Phoney from Muslims for Liberty. 
who, to correct the record, that Mark Edge on one of his F Facebook pages that he put on the internets about me, because he gets his rocks off smearing me. Uh, Mark Edge, last time I tried to challenge the uh, the phony to something that he said about brandishing uh, cops brandishing weapons on peaceful Muslims in Oklahoma last October, which didn't happen, by the way. You can Google it. There was a interesting news story with the woman that was dressed like a member of the KKK, but in a brown suit instead of a white one with eyes. I have no mouth. idea what you're talking. I know, about. I know you don't have any. You can't idea, go all but the way back to a call five. that happened in, no, in I'm October to and expect to people Mark, to know. He does know what I'm talking about? Mark, do you know what he's talking My about? Is, I remember him Mark, talking about it. Will, uh, James talking about it at one point. Minister Edge, may I respond to your comments that I noticed you took down from the internet as well? Because I actually did respond to your comment on your F Facebook page about me. But those comments seem, seem to have disappeared. I don't know why. Are you referring to the things James Witt says Facebook page? Uh, Mark and Ian both know what I'm talking about. But for the benefit well, of the listeners, yeah, the audience, yes. Yeah. But Mark all of a sudden knows what I'm talking about but won't respond because— Mark, did you take down you, a post that you would made about James? No, if I he did, took I down don't... comments. Oh, didn't comments. Take down the post. Are you moderating took comments, down comments, Mark? I don't think so. Are there other moderators really, on Mark? that page? Where are yours? I, I don't know the there answer, James. I there. don't know what you're talking about. That's the answer. Okay, then I'll rewind, remind the oh, good. audience that Mark Edge said I didn't know what I, I got tripped up by Mar, uh, Will Phoney because I didn't know what I was talking about. Well, the question that I asked, Will Phoney knew what I was talking about because it was his words. I know he remembers suggesting that cops right. were brandishing weapons on his friends, but he switched you know, it to a You what's really event. great on national I, radio? James's little no, nitpicking nit about people on the internet. Words, Mark, Na- J- Look, James, National what I want to understand radio. here, I'm, I got to say, I'm confused. Are you, so, what you're saying is that Mark deleted some comments of yours on the James Witt Facebook or the uh, things James Witt says Facebook page. Is that what this ca- call is about? Hello. All right. Well, thanks for the call. If you don't want to talk, then we can't have conversation on the radio. So it sounds like he's upset, Mark, that uh, some comments were allegedly deleted from the Things James Witt Says Facebook page. This is a page you've created because James, uh, this man who just called, will sometimes send what you consider to be threatening uh, statements to you via our Skype message. He spends a remarkable amount of time talking about my death. Yeah. He doesn't specifically say he's going to kill you. He's had you. a couple of threatening statements. But there have been some things that you've been concerned with. Yeah. And you have decided to create this Facebook page to, I guess, catalog some of these statements. Sure. Um, have you People ever erased a statement that you have posted on there? He said, well, he said it was comments, not the, the original comment. post. Yeah. Have you been moderating comments on the James Wood page? If I did do it, I, di- I, I don't do it on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I couldn't say one way or the other. Uh, like, I, I just don't remember doing it. You if don't I did remember it. it. Okay. Are there other moderators? Who I can tell you it? this: I am beyond the point of dealing with James Witt fa- fairly, right? Like I, mm-hmm. I've moved past that point, whatever this is, until that man starts um, a apology. I don't know if he has to apologize for threatening me. Mm-hmm. He just has to start acting differently and, like, you know, not acting like sort of a belligerent weirdo. Um, and if he stops acting like that, then I'll pull that page down. Like, I know that that page upsets him, mm-hmm. but I think that he loves it because he goes on there and he comments away. He? Like, he's a he's a star on that page. Oh, really? I mean, he's a— I haven't been to it for a well, long time. Well, he is now. I mean, now that he's mm-hmm. on there, he's got to made himself a, a Facebook profile with no picture, right? He's just got that little blank Facebook thing. Okay. And then he just goes on there and rambles on. Are you sure on. it's him? Pretty sure? Yes. Pretty sure uh, I've, I've seen the writing style enough. That's how I get these. Yeah. These aren't – I don't go through the the uh, um, archives and uh, listen to the show. These are just cut and pastes mm-hmm. from our uh, Skype here where he'll you know, prattle on and, and in the process threaten us. So just to clarify, are there other people who are moderators of no. that page? So nope. it's you, your page? Yes. Okay. So if somebody erases a comment, then it would be you. Yeah. And okay, if I did – you don't remember that. I love the fact that I did it to him. Like, I just don't care. You know, like, my page and you're a psychotic weirdo. So, you know, uh, whatever. If it, make, if it makes him crazy, fine, good. So, anyway, back to uh, topless ladies and gentlemen. There were some gentlemen that were topless. In fact, according to one of the attendees at uh, Hampton Beach, 
today. She said, of I course, just got another like at uh, things James Witt says. Great. Congratulations. Just saying. Um, so anyway, the uh, topless event, one of the attendees said there were probably 40 or 50, uh, apparently 40 or 50 people that were in attendance in total. Yeah, about 40 or 50 uh, that more, excuse me, about 40 or 50 supporters and then maybe about two dozen or so women that were there. Lots of people there uh, were taking pictures and many of the ladies were more than happy to be photographed with some of the people that were there with their cameras. We'll talk more about it and you can join us here with your thoughts at 855-450-FREE. That's 855-450-3733. Were you at one of these topless events that happened today and hopefully it was uneventful? Hopefully nobody got arrested. I haven't heard of that yet, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. So share your thoughts. 855-450-FREE. Plus, coming up, the puritanical glee over the Ashley Madison hack. The three most important things you can do for Free Talk Live are, one, share one episode a week on Facebook or in some other social networking site. Two, buy the things you buy online through shop.freetalklive.com. Three, give five bucks a month to the AMP program. It's my firm belief that Free Talk Live's AMP program is the best use of your charitable dollar among liberty-oriented organizations. Support all the organizations you love. But make sure you give five bucks a month to AMP at amp.freetalklive.com. Approximately 300 people attending the topless event today in New York City's Times Square and many more in cities all around the globe. Something like 60 cities participating in this event uh, that happened all around uh, the globe today. D.C., however, only had one woman standing in front of the White House. She uh, was posing like the Statue of Liberty. Edinburgh, Scotland had about 50 people, mostly women, taking their tops off in the city's main streets. They staged a sit-in for two hours there at Hampton Beach in New Hampshire. Bare-chested women and men took part in a photo call to show their support for the worldwide movement, although the weather was not particularly good in New Hampshire today for this. Go Topless had been uh, urging both men and women to stand up with topless pride on August 23rd to honor the 95th anniversary of Women's Equality Day and to support the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, I don't know what that is. I don't know what the Equal Rights Amendment is. That, uh, is that something from, like, 95 years ago, or is that some sort of thing they're trying to promote today? They said the passage of the Equal Right, right Amendment? Yeah. Okay, um, all I... I was a kid when this was going on, but I would say this was the early 80s. There was a, uh, a movement to get an equal rights amendment, and I think it was mainly based on women. Um, and uh, the idea was equal pay, things like that. It's actually 1923. It was introduced for the first time. Okay. Well, there was a push, um, I'm going to say, in the uh, early 80s. Yeah, there was a ratification deadline of March of 1979, okay. apparently, for this. All right. So I guess it was a long Long time in the works. All right. So uh, let's see. Also, spokeswoman Rachel Jesse said centuries of gender inequality and exclusive male rule created major planetary imbalances that could prove fatal to society. It's time for change. It's liberating. This has what to do with taking your shirt off? Uh, It's liberating, she said, and empowering for women to free their bodies from repression, freeing nipples and bodies, freeing minds or freeze minds as well, restoring self-image and self-esteem and i think that these ladies have done a great job and i really I, i'm i'm bummed i didn't go to some extent but there were a couple of issues that prevented me from doing so because i've you know i participated in the infamous topless tuesdays that happened here in Keene about five years ago now actually one of the more controversial events that liberty activists have taken part in here so i i was of the mind to go and participate in this but the problem was and I understand why they did this, but the Facebook group that, or the Facebook event for this uh, event that happened in Hampton Beach today specified that there was no time that people were supposed to show up. There was not a specific location beyond Hampton Beach, which I imagine is a fairly large uh, place. And so there wasn't any you know, specific location or time. So the idea was, and I understand what they're, they were thinking, the idea was, well, this is a normal thing. That we need to make this normal for women to be seen topless. And so the idea was you just show up and go to the beach. So you bring your family, you bring your friends or whatever. You bring yourself and you just go to the beach and you have a day at the beach as a topless person. And that was kind of the the, the concept there. And I get that. 
I, I can understand why they wanted to do it that way. But at the same time, they, like they didn't want to be people, a spectacle. People are buoyed by the presence of others that agree with them. Um, they're, That's true. You know, they're emotionally buoyed. Strength in numbers. Yeah, strength in numbers. And I think that they would have had. It, the, the, I think it's a better idea to put a place and a time, and uh, you know, put it at a time early so that people can get there early and then stay as late as they'd like. But that way, they are surrounded by people who um, support them and, and that sort of thing. Now, apparently, they did find one another. Some of them did because yeah, again, that's because they wanted to. Well, yes, there's that. But the weather was also bad, and so the, the, whatever few people were actually at the beach today, because it was apparently rainy and somewhat cold uh, in Hampton Beach, New Hampshire, they all kind of uh, coalesced underneath one particular structure there. And so it was probably a little easier for them to find one another, given that the beach wasn't packed with thousands of people, as it could have certainly have been had it been a, a super nice day today. So that was one of the missteps of the event was that there wasn't a specific time and place to meet. And so I didn't want to go out. I didn't know what the weather was going to be like, first of all. But I, if the weather was nice, I certainly didn't want to go out and just, you know, show up on a beach with thousands of people. And OK, now what? Right? There's no, there's What do I do there? Right. I mean, I can go and play some volleyball, go swimming or whatever, but, you know, I can go to any beach any day and and do that. Um, I I'm definitely interested in the activism side of these kind of things. And so that's why I think that the upcoming event that they're supposedly planning in Laconia, I think is going to be more interesting because Laconia is the only place in New Hampshire. It's a relatively small city on the, uh, the in the so-called lakes regions, so sort of on the eastern side, central eastern side of the state. They uh, they do have an, an ordinance, a town ordinance against being topless as a female, and that is contrary to state law. So it's an illegal ordinance, uh, but apparently it has been enforced during like the bike week that they have there. I imagine instance. that's why it exists is bike yeah. week. And uh, and as long as people just pay the fines, then no one challenges the illegality of it. So these ladies are now planning an event which has yet to be announced as far as which day it's going to be. But that's going to be happening in Laconia, in downtown Laconia. And there's no way you're not going to have a spectacle that way, right? You're going to commit civil disobedience against a bad town ordinance that you need to have a time for. There needs to be a very specific location. You don't want to have people dispersed throughout the city of Laconia. If you're going to be doing civil disobedience, you're going to have people together in one place for the reasons you specified why people want to be in groups, Mark. It's especially true if you're actually going to be you know, facing arrest for, uh, for doing this. So we'll continue to update you as that story develops. The other big mistake that was made today with the topless equality event in Hampton Beach was they had this Facebook event, which was huge. Over 1,100 people said they were attending this. A few hundred people said maybe. 1,100 people. That's a lot of people for a, a protest event. In a place like New Hampshire, it's a small place. So I was pretty blown away by those numbers. Now, I know that's not going to be what shows up. I knew it wouldn't even be. I was hoping, you know, even on a good day, I was hoping to see a few dozen people. And there actually were a couple dozen ladies show up and then a few dozen more supporters uh, were there. So I think considering the weather, considering the fact that there wasn't a specific time, I thought that was actually a pretty good turnout. But the thing they really blew was... The night before, so last night, somebody posted on the Facebook event that tomorrow morning we'll, we're going to delete the Facebook event. And I didn't understand why that was, but I also felt like, eh, you know, these ladies don't really know me. I don't really feel like I should make a stand and say, hey, you shouldn't do that. Maybe I should have posted. I don't know if anybody did. But here's why that was a terrible idea. So anybody that's organizing an event, keep this in mind. When you delete the event, everyone gets a notice that says such and such event was well, canceled. I did see that. Um, actually, they I got that, and I I don't I think I I don't think I said I was going to go to that event. Um, so but I think you got I was, the notice. Anyway. I was invited. Did you say maybe? Probably not. No, I don't. I don't really click anything on. Well, those. regardless, you got the notice that it was canceled. Right. But I bet you didn't go to the event the night before and and read the post that said, "Hey, we're going to cancel the event in the morning, but don't worry, it's still happening." Yeah. So, had anyone happened to have gone that night and read the event page, which probably not even a tenth of the people on that page have bothered to do on a regular basis. So, basically, no one in the event saw the fact that the event organizer was going to cancel the event in the morning, but yet it was still on. Oops. And all they got was this notice saying, the event's been canceled. So, that probably was, a, besides the weather, another major contributor to why some people didn't go 
to uh, the event in Hampton today. Yeah, I can't imagine why they chose to delete it, but I'm sure they had their reason. I don't know what the—I can't even fathom what the reason some for that str- would be. Some, some tactical reason, but I don't know what it would be. All I can say is, as far as the uh, toplessness goes, it seems to me that very few women are interested in um, you know, being topless. There were over 1,100 people who said they were going to attend that, and it was there, mostly women commenting in that group. There are, there are 1.3 million people in, Amer- in, uh, the, in New Hampshire, yeah. and uh, there may be people who came from outside of New Hampshire, too. So, yes, Maybe. I get it, and I'm not saying that – I believe that I have to support people um, that are looking for more freedom in their lives, even if it's an issue that I care very little about. So they have my support. Mm-hmm. It's just that they don't really, they haven't captured my heart, as it were. So, you know, there you go. Well, I'm grateful uh, for them. I'm glad they went out and did it. I'm looking forward to round number two when they actually go and do civil disobedience in Laconia. I will definitely be there for that. Uh, that's worth a trip. 855 450 free. That is our toll free number. We've got Skype as well. You can join us here. Skype username is lrn.fm. We'll talk a little bit about Puritans. Here in moments, and of course, you can join us on the radio waves, 855-450-FREE. That's 855-450-3733. This is Free Talk Live's Live Sunday Show. This is Free Talk Live. Whatever you want to discuss can go if you dial in toll-free and join us here at 855-450-FREE. With you tonight, you've got Ian... And Mark. 855-450-3733. Don't forget, we've got Skype. Skype username is lrn.fm. Since we've been talking about the topless events, and we actually had one relatively puritanical-sounding caller who was totally fine with women. uh, Well, well, he wanted women to keep their shirts on, but he was totally fine with women or uh, men keeping theirs off, which is the whole point behind these topless events is to make women and men equal. In society's eyes, it's already equal under some of the laws, under some of the the statutes in some states, like here in New Hampshire, it's technically legal for women to be topless in public. But that doesn't mean that it's done commonly, and it doesn't mean that uh, there isn't this social stigma that we experienced earlier with this caller surrounding that. Now, a related story from firstlook.org, which is Glenn Greenwald's new website, newish, I guess it's probably been around for about a year. High school students, he writes, have long read The Scarlet Letter, the 1850 novel by Nathaniel Hawthorne set in a puritanical Massachusetts town in the mid-17th century. It chronicles the life of a woman who is found to have committed adultery, and as punishment, she's forced to stand before her village with the letter A attached to her dress. The intent is to forever publicly shame her for her moral transgression. As The Atlantic noted in 1886, the punishment of The Scarlet Letter is a historic fact, historical fact. The moral premise of that ritual. It's also a legal thing, um, you know, in in many states and places, uh, there's no legal, uh, it's basically a social thing about not women not being able to go topless. The moral premise of that ritual is animating, its animating righteousness is by no means an obsolete relic of the puritanical era. It is as vibrant as ever. Busybodies sitting in judgment of and righteously condemning the private sexual acts of other adults remains one of the most self-satisfying and entertaining and thus the most popular of public spectacles. It simultaneously uplifts the moral judges, distracts them from their own behaviors because they're focusing on other people's sins and thus not their own, and titillates. To condemn this, I simply must immerse myself in the tawdry details of their sexual acts. Uh, He's writing that in parentheses. To see just how current is the mentality driving the scarlet letter, observe the reaction to the Ashley Madison hack. Ah. Now, we've been talking about this hack over the last couple days here on the program. As you know, there are now, uh, or as you may know, there are now more than 30 gigs worth of data that has been hacked and released from this website that promotes itself as a pro-infidelity venue where married people can find sexual partners and have an affair. There was even a guaranteed affair package where if you paid $250 a month, they would guarantee that you would have sex outside of your marriage. And that probably meant they were hiring a prostitute, but that's another matter. The data published by the hackers includes the names, physical, and email addresses, and credit card purchases provided by the users, along with whatever information they posted about their sexual desires and proclivities. The primary justification offered by the hackers was that the uh, the site was a scam. They claimed the female profiles were fake, and the site demanded payment in order to remove users' profiles, but ultimately they did not remove the data as they promised. Uh, The hackers, of course, portrayed themselves as fraud-fighting vigilantes. They threatened to release all of the users' data unless the site owners removed the site completely. 
But there was also a significant component of sexual moralism to the hackers' self-described mission. In their original manifesto, they echoed the moral paternalism offered by Gawker's Max Reed to justify his site's outing of an obscure married financial officer of a Merit magazine company. The hackers proclaimed, too bad for those men. They're churning, uh, cheating dirtbags and deserve no such discretion, unquote. In yesterday's statement announcing their data dump, the hackers directly well, lectured the users they were exposing with this sermon. For one, we have no clue um, whether these people are cheating or not. Um, now, well, I'm not going to say I'm not going to say that I that I believe that a lot of relationships in America are open relationships. But yeah. I I will say this: that if uh, if you are in an open relationship, my guess is it's a lot easier for the gal to uh, mm-hmm. to go out and get some strange than it is for the guy. And that um, you know these guys may very well have been using this service for that purpose. Now the website states what it's about, but that it, it would serve a married man in an open relationship well because he would be getting a woman who is not looking for a relationship. a relationship in the same way. I can see what you're saying. I think that's true, Mark, that you can't say for sure what each of these users were up to on Ashley Madison's website. However, you can presume that uh, many of them were likely looking to have an affair. Well, I, I, that's the stated purpose of yep. the website, but you could also – it could be a guy who's not in a relationship at all that's, that's just true. not looking for ties that wants to tell a woman he's in a relationship. That way he's, he, does, you know, he isn't dealing with the women that are trying to get in a relationship. Well, that's why they have Tinder for, though, right? I, I don't know. Look, I, I don't think I've Tinder heard. has a lot of older guys on it would be my guess. Good I don't point. know the answer. Learn your lesson. I don't know either. Learn your lesson and make amends, said the hackers. Embarrassing now, but you'll get over it. Unquote. The cheating scoundrels of Ashley Madison got what they deserved was the widespread sentiment yesterday, despite how common both infidelity and online pornography are. Tweets expressing moralistic glee were legion. Websites were created to enable easy searches of the hacked data by email address. An Australian radio station offered to tell listeners on air if their spouse's names appeared in the database and informed one horrified woman that her husband's name did. The Washington Post actually promoted those newly created searching sites under the encouraging headline, How to Search the Ashley Madison Leak, helpfully linking to a site that will, quote, tell you if an email address or phone number appears in the leaked files. When the leak was first announced last month, the Post published a similar article headlined, Was Your Spouse on Ashley Madison? A New Breed of Private Eye is Ready to Help. Hmm. The names of prominent figures appearing in the database have already been published, some of whom insist they never use the site. It's hard to overstate the devastation to some people's lives from having their names published as part of this hack, not only to their relationships with their spouses and children, but to their careers, reputations, and depending on where they live, possibly their liberty or even their life. What appears on the Internet is permanent and inescapable. All of the people whose names appear in this database will now be permanently branded with a digital A. Whether they actually did what they are accused of will be irrelevant. Digital lynch mobs offer no due process or appeals, and it seems certain that many of the people whose lives are harmed or ruined by this hack will have been guilty of nothing. Because it could be hard to explain if you're not in an open relationship to someone who is your lover that your information was found on this website, even if you didn't actually do it, right? Because you could use uh, anyone's email address to sign up for an account. Things get a little stickier when someone uses your credit card data to run a charge on an account under your name. Then it starts to look a little bit more like you actually did this yourself. Uh, But, you know, there are situations that someone could get into here where they're accused of being a user of this site, and they weren't. Well, hold on. Um, There was a situation with uh, the guy from The Who. I can't remember what his name. You know, I can't say I'm a big uh, um, remembering of names of entertainment people. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, those that care will remember his name. Townsend. That sounds right. Where he was investigating online child porn. So he claimed. So he claimed. And, well, why would you think he was doing something else? Isn't it more likely that somebody's investigating how easy it is? People say it's easy to find child porn online. Mm-hmm. How do you know it's easy? Because somebody told you or because you went and checked yourself? Mm-hmm. If you believe it's because somebody told you, you, you know, you're, the what's, you're the what's wrong with this world because you just believe crap people tell you. If you went out and found for your, um, tried to find out for yourself, well, then you uh, run the risk of getting arrested. This is one of these problems, these conundrums. So people could be going on and simply investigating um, Ashley Madison by creating an account.
And if they created an account, but they didn't buy anything, I don't think they're guilty of anything other than just sort of, uh, you know, what what, what this is about. Having to explain that to someone who is, you know, finding out on their own that their lover was on this website could be a difficult thing to do, right? Like, oh, no, I wasn't using it for the intended purpose of the site. As uh, Glenn Greenwald points out here, some might just use the site as pornography because it titillates them. Uh, or because they're attempted uh, tempted to cheat, but are resisting the urge. Or because they're married, but in a relationship where monogamy is not demanded. Or because they're researchers or journalists observing this precinct of online interaction or countless other reasons. This permanent, highly public shaming of these so-called adulterers is not only puritanical, but reckless in the extreme. Since many who ended up branded with the Scarlet A may have done absolutely nothing wrong. This underscores how invasions of digital privacy can be misleading as they are invasive. It's similar to the NSA's analysis of metadata, with whom one communicates, where one goes, to determine who is a terrorist and who should be targeted with drones. Algorithmic assumptions of those sorts can lead to looking at someone who visits Taliban hotspots and communicates with al-Qaeda members and declaring them based on that data to be a leading terrorist when in fact the terrorist is nothing more than the Pakistan bureau chief of Al Jazeera engaged in that behavior in order to do his job. But let's confine ourselves to a discussion of those who actually use the Ashley Madison site to cheat on their spouse with the worst possible sense of the word, namely used it to find and have sex with someone outside of their marriage despite a vow of monogamy. Even in that scenario, adultery, as Adam Johnson put it, is a moral misdemeanor, something the law does not even punish. To destroy someone's reputation and life over it is so wildly out of proportion to the actual transgression. Put the rest of the story on our Facebook and Twitter. You can check it out. I think it's excellent. And you can share your thoughts with us on it tomorrow at your leisure or bring up anything you want. That's the point of Free Talk Live. And uh, join us online, by the way, in the meantime, over at freetalklive.com. If you're not on our Facebook and Twitter, you can find those at news.freetalklive.com, and that'll link you right to it. See you tomorrow. Keenvention is coming up fast, October 30th through November 1st. Get your tickets now at keenvention.info. Keenvention is an intimate event where you can meet dozens of key liberty activists from across the Shire, including Oath Keeper Chris Reitman, Libertarian presidential candidate Daryl W. Perry, Radical Agendas Chris Cantwell, Neocash Radio's Dr. Darren Tapp, State Representative Mike Sylvia rated an A-plus by the NHLA, The Seditious Sirens, The Rebel Love Show's Rob Mathias, Tech Guru Brian Sovereign, Cop blocker J.P. Freeman, new mover Dr. Taryn Lupo, longtime political activist Dennis Goddard, Church of the Invisible Hand Minister Rich Paul, Shire Dude, and dozens more. Only 100 tickets are available in advance, so lock yours in now for just $60 or with Bitcoin. That includes access to the Hello Keen costume dance party. Reserve your tickets now at keenvention.info. Visit keenvention.info for more speaker announcements, or look for our page and event on Facebook. That's keenvention.info.